Just a brief note of uh, organization before we start. Uh, I'm going to approach uh, diseases of rats from a pathologist's perspective rather than a clinician's. Um, and I'm going to do that by organ system because that's usually the way, as pathologists, we interface with rodent diseases often. Um, that's not to say that we're, we don't participate in the clinical function in, in uh, some uh, aspects, but very often your first indication that there is something wrong is you're looking at the, you may be looking at the slides. <coughs> and so I've set this up so that we would review both rats and, and uh, uh, next uh, mice um, by organ system, and we'll start from the most important, from my perspective, with the most important organ system to the least important organ system. And within each organ system, uh, I have grouped the diseases by etiology. And that's because often similar uh, etiologies or groups of etiologies may cause similar host responses and therefore lesions. So the organization of this allows you to, let's say, <coughs> we're going to look at the respiratory system and viral diseases, and those responses are often similar so that it gives you, when looking at the respiratory system or the lung of a, of a rat, you see a lesion it creates the opportunity for you to have in front of you a differential diagnosis of the diseases that I should consider when looking um, at rat lungs, okay? <coughs> uh, there will be more histology in this lecture uh, than is often the case in many other similar lectures of different species, and that's partly because uh, gross pathology is very difficult to record in, uh, um, in rodents. <coughs> All right, uh, just briefly, um, I'd like to say uh, there are some special considerations uh, that we have uh, in looking at diseases in rats and, and uh, to, to the same extent mice. Um, and uh, amongst those principles are, very importantly, um, one subclinical infection is far more important than overt disease. And you have to be aware of this, I think, as a working pathologist. There are tremendous ramifications uh, um, to this principle in research because um, as clinicians or laboratory animal veterinarians are used to looking at animals and for clinical signs, if there are no clinical signs, the animal is apparently normal. Um, many, many of the diseases that you may um, interface with as a pathologist are going to be lesions from animals that are relatively normal clinically, all right? So you have to be aware of the potential for subclinical infection to impact on the study. This would be especially so um, in immunological considerations or immunological studies um, in which uh, uh, measuring immune function is part of the uh, experimental protocol. Um, then if you have intercurrent infectious diseases, that's going to greatly influence this. Uh, we'll look at some specific examples of that uh, when we get to those diseases, but I've been involved in a number of cases where um, the animals were apparently normal uh, and on study, uh, and then when we got into uh, looking at post-mortem examination and histopathology, there were tremendous lesions present uh, that weren't controlled for or weren't accounted for that effectively, um, in some cases, uh, um, interfered with experimental data and in some cases caused political problems uh, that, we have to, that we had to deal with. And, and those cases will come up when we look at them. Any, anyway, remember the principle is that clinical disease is the tip of the iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg, all right? Also, another principle is that there is tremendous strain variability in susceptibility and response to uh, disease agents. Um, often, uh, the manifestations of lesions and incidences uh, of different diseases and lesions are related to genetics and breeding. And uh, for many different strains, um, each, each has a very homogeneous response uh, uh, to stress or to uh, disease agents, okay? And that's nice. We like, to have, uh, we like to have those, that homogeneous response, because it decreases the variability in experimental protocols, okay? But this homogeneity of response also um, creates quite a divergence amongst the different strains in how they respond to different diseases and different agents, okay? So you have to view this uh, in, in the light uh, when you're looking at particular diseases and uh, um, lesions. You need to be aware of what strain of animal the disease or the, uh, the lesion was initially described in because you may, not, you may be looking at a different strain 
and the lesions may be very suggestive but not quite characteristic of classic full-blown response. So the disease is the same disease, but it looks a little bit different than classically described because you're dealing with a different strain, okay? And actually, over the years, uh, <clears throat> for me, I, it's almost like treating these strains as different species. Fisher rats and Sprague dolly rats, um, to some extent, might as well be different species in their response to certain infectious diseases or their incidence of tumors and things. And so, so the difference is that can be that marked, okay? Another principle uh, um, that's a little bit different from our experiences in clinicians and pathologists is expect the unusual, all right? Because you look, you look at large numbers of individual a of animals, um, depending upon where you work, you may see, let's say, you may see the Zimbel's glands from 2,000 animals a year, okay? Well, a lesion that occurs with a 1% incidence, if you're looking at 2,000 animals a year, you're going to see 20 cases of that a year. Well, you know, as a clinician or a pathologist, you see 20 of anything in a year, and that starts to be common, all right? So you, you look at the pathology tables in, in the reference books, and you see things that such and such occurs with an incidence of 1%. That sounds low. Expect to see a lot of that, okay? And then lastly, um, think herd health. You know, go back to those preventive medicine uh, lectures that we all slept through in vet school. All of, all of us did. Obviously, the people in preventive medicine didn't sleep through them, right? But uh, um, remember that you're dealing with herds here and not individual animals. And herd health is very, very important. For us, it's rarely the case that we're interested in individual animal health. We're trying to think of protecting this herd, all right? And by the time that you see clinical disease, all right, by the time you've diagnosed Sendai pneumonia, um, the, sh the, the show's over. Okay. I mean, you've got this disease in the colony. It may be impacting on the immune response. It may be changing interferon levels. It's ruining the experimental protocol. So herd health is absolutely everything, all right? All right, let's start with uh, the respiratory system. And I'm going to start with viral diseases of the respiratory system. And uh, the first disease I want to consider is uh, Sialodacrior adenitis virus infection. Um, or so-called SDAV. Uh, this, is a corona, this is a coronaviral disease, uh, which is highly, highly contagious. It's generally non-fatal. <coughs> Both adults and weanling animals uh, um, may be affected. And uh, in my experience, there are two patterns of disease expression <coughs> that we see in this. Uh, one is an endemic infection in breeding colonies which tends to be sort of, you know, low, low level and often may be, very often may be overlooked. And then there are the explosive epizootics in, in weanlings <coughs> and young adults, and that often is what is clinically visible, okay? The clinical signs we expect to see uh, when you do have over clinical infection, uh, quite frequently you'll see signs of keratoconjunctivitis. Um, there may be uh, lacrimation, there's excessive lacrimation, the animal is exhibiting uh, corneal opacities, which, which may progress to corneal ulceration. And uh, they have this red uh, ocular discharge that occurs you know, as a nonspecific response in many upper respiratory infections in rats. <coughs> so when you see that, it's often a sign that there is nonspecific um, a, UR, a URI, but it doesn't, it's not going to occur ex only in SDAV infection because it occurs in the other upper respiratory infections as well. Um, the animals may show signs of, of uh, photophobia. They may be winking and blinking, and you may see sneezing and wiping the nose. I mean, all the things associated with upper respiratory infection, uh, the animals may be expressing that, okay? <coughs> Keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, may be the only clinical detectable sign. All right, so again, uh, um, good surveillance uh, um, should be able to pick this up. This disease is so infectious that a single infected rat, okay, placed in a new colony is enough to initiate a full-blown epizootic. So the way to defend yourself against SDAV infection is to have a clean colony, institute uh, the appropriate uh, um, quarantine procedures and never and never um, 
never let it uh, get into your colony. <coughs> um, sometimes, if you're very perceptive, <coughs> and if the animals are being handled and felt, um, the animals will develop a ventral uh, cervical swelling, which is which are the salivary glands, which are the, uh, the submandibular salivary glands that will swell up. And we'll look at a picture of this in a minute. But uh, my experience, uh, not, not so much mine uh, when I was a, a younger pathologist, but the uh, um, laboratory animal handlers uh, picked this disease up in an institution that I worked in, and we were able to appreciate that, that swelling. So it is, uh, it is uh, appreciable. <coughs> Here's an animal with, uh, you can see, he's got this uh, reddish uh, discharge uh, in the uh, medial canthus of his eye. <coughs> All right, uh, in terms of gross pathology, the submaxillary, uh, the parotid, and the exorbital, the infraorbital, and the hardarian glands may be enlarged, pale yellow, and edematous. They may be, uh, the submaxillary and the parotid glands may be either unilaterally or bilaterally enlarged. And here is an example of, uh, of these uh, uh, glands here. And I really need a, a, a normal or a control for you to see to appreciate that these are larger than they normally should be. They glisten a little bit, suggesting that there is edema there and, uh, they're, they're, uh, and, and wet, uh, signs of nonspecific inflammation. And here is a, a sort of an on-face view or a coronal section uh, um, just to sort of get you oriented, I mean, this is the oral cavity and the hard palate. Um, there is the olfactory lobe of the brain, and so we're, you know, these are the ocular areas here, and these are the hardarian glands, and you can see here this animal has, um, on the left side here, he has grayish opacity and redness, which is um, edema and congestion, and a little bit of swelling here as opposed to the glands on the right side, which are relatively normal. So in this case, he has unilateral um, sialo, uh, uh, dacri or da dacrioadenitis, ac actually, and uh, a nice example uh, uh, showing that uh, unilaterality. Uh, again, here's a similar uh, um, on-face or uh, coronal section, and the swelling isn't quite as uh, obvious. You can see, again, the same orientation. Here, the, the mandible is still on. There's a cross-section of the tongue. A normal gland, and here, this is gland over here that's got some areas of hemorrhage in it. Okay, the histopathology, um, uh, one of the things that you might remember is that the serous and the seromucoid glands only are involved. So the mucous salivary glands, you'll never see uh, inflammation in the mucous salivary glands, only in the serous part. And of course, uh, the eye is involved because of the keratoconjunctivitis. You may see uh, thymic involvement, and uh, in my experience, the changes in the cervical lymph nodes aren't tremendous. There's lymphoid hyperplasia, but there's not lots of necrosis or anything like that. Um, a little bit, <coughs> the histopathology depends upon the timing of when you see this. Um, and uh, as, you go, as we go through the sort of the evolution of the lesion, I mean, it begins with epithelial necrosis, both acinar and, uh, and ductular, and uh, um, with that associated um, neutrophilic inflammation, um, and sort of a sero serous uh, um, this is a term maybe sero mucoid edema. <coughs> it may be sufficiently uh, severe as to efface the entire architecture of the gland, and then within a week, within five to seven days, uh, you get recovery. Uh, uh, you get recovery by squamous metaplasia, uh, which then becomes a sort of remodels, and you get regeneration of the epithelium. And within 30 days' time, the gland is histologically normal, and there's no evidence that there was ever an infection there. Uh, here's an example of acute sialoadenitis. <coughs> Um, and here uh, you can see that there's uh, a pycnotic debris and acute necrosis and sloughing of the uh, epithelium. 
Uh, closer up, again, we can see a nice example, relatively normal um, serous glands around here, and then here is epithelial necrosis. Maybe just as there's a little edema and separation of those asinine and ducts. Now, this one's got some age on it, <coughs> all right? <coughs> now we have a, a sort of a full-blown uh, lymphocytic inflammatory response. There's still a significant edema fluid in the interstitium. And now look at all of the uh, um, squamous metaplasia here in the recovery phase of this. Again, nice uh, <coughs> ep piling up of epithelial cells. Still some residual inflammation in here and uh, edema. Um, a very nice slide <coughs> uh, sort of fortuitously arrived at. This is one of the uh, infraorbital glands or the Hardirian glands. And you can see here there are three lobules in this gland. And you can see <coughs> uh, the lobules are affected at different times. I mean, here is a portion of the gland that is relatively normal. <coughs> here is one that has acute inflammation. And here is one that is in the recovery phase that has more, the more chronic inflammatory response. And it's almost as if... <coughs> the infection is moving through the gland like this. So it was here first, and now it's recovery and moving here, and, uh, and not quite infected that part of the lobule of the gland yet. Um, there is, I did mention, the Zakerito conjunctivitis that occurs quite frequently in this, and here's an example of that. Here is uh, uh, cornea, here's corneal epithelium, and you can see there is quite a bit of uh, acute and subacute inflammation here. There's congestion, uh, dilatation, uh, dilatation, ectasia of these vessels, and you can see the separation of the corneal fibers here with edema fluid, all of which contributes to the corneal opacity that we see or appre appreciate clinically. Um, just a word in, in brief, uh, although there is not much medical significance to SDAV infection, um, I think I think in immunosuppressed animals, uh, it can be much more a much more severe problem than normal. But usually, um, this is sort of sort of like a childhood disease of of, my, uh, of rats. You can look at it that way, and that that it doesn't affect their overall health. However, <coughs> I will tell you that uh, years ago, I participated in the uh, bi the chronic bioassay for formaldehyde. And uh, in that study, uh, some of you may know that that the results of that study indicated that. Um, the animals on the experimental regimen developed squamous cell carcinomas in their nasal cavities, which was, uh, at the time, uh, tremendous significance because of the pervasiveness of formaldehyde in industry and in our culture. Um, and so, politically, this was a hot potato, in a sense. Um, the first thing that happened in that study is that the, the political people, uh, the, the consultants and the regulatory people and the attorneys seized on the fact that we had a transient epizootic of SDAV during that study. <clears throat> and it was only because the study had an 18-month interim sacrifice did we pick that up, that what we discovered at the 18-month interim sacrifice is animals with those residual recovering lesions of SDAV infection, all right? made absolutely <clears throat> no difference in the study at all. And yet people who were looking for ways to invalidate the study tried to make a case that the study was flawed because they had SDAV infection. And I, don't, I think ultimately the way it was resolved that it wasn't important because it turns out that 10 years of research later indicated that, that it, while formaldehyde clearly looks like <coughs> it is a chronic risk problem, for rats and mice, it isn't for human beings, and that's just a species difference. But nonetheless, I mean, here's an example of a, of a common disease, no impact on the health of the animals that created tremendous political problems because it occurred during that study. And those are the kinds of problems that I think we have to deal with in rodent pathology quite frequently. Okay, uh, rat coronavirus um, is, a, uh, is a related coronavirus to SDAV infection. Uh, SDAV, um, it has shared, uh, it shares antigens with SDAV. The tightness of the relationship to it, is this a strain variability or strain difference in this? It's possible it may be an emerging virus. Um, it's not very common. Um, it does tend to produce uh, subclinical disease uh, with the same sort of spectrum that we see um, with SDAV infection. Uh, both adults and uh, uh, weanlings may be involved. Um, in this case, I think that uh, um, 
The disease may be fatal in weanling rats, but they rapidly develop resistance to it so that by seven days, um, there isn't uh, the ability to produce a fatal infection is uh, um, are greatly curtailed. Um, and and as, a, as an example of the variability in strain uh, susceptibility in this, um, mortality in 48 hour old fisher rats uh, is 100%. So uh, young, young fisher rats, <coughs> two days of age, infected 100% die. Um, similar aged with star rats, the mortality is 10 to 25%. So same, same strain of, uh, of uh, pathogen, different strain of rat, and different variability in their response to this. So if you weren't aware of that, um, those strain differences, uh, you know, what, what you're seeing may be different from what you've read in the literature, and that may be because of different strains in the host. Okay. Um, <coughs> what we tend to see in this disease is uh, focal interstitial pneumonia with peribronchial or uh, uh, lymphocytic inflammation. And uh, upper respiratory lesions identical to SDAV. Sialoadenitis, uh, uh, however, is rare. <coughs> so that probably if you're looking at salivary gland infection, you're probably looking at SDAV rather than rat coronavirus. There are ways to separate these out by serology, so getting an absolute diagnosis is not a problem. So in trying to construct uh, differential diagnoses, other things that you can consider with uh, SDAV infection, you could uh, obviously you should consider uh, uh, rat coronavirus. Uh, um, you need to be aware that Sendai virus, uh, um, which is has been described in, uh, as a disease of mice originally, now has been described in rats. Uh, the same is true for pneumonia virus of mice, now is known to affect, infect rats. Um, obviously, the big one to consider is mycoplasma. <clears throat> other bacterial agents, and then uh, um, a chronic ammonia inhalation and vitamin A deficiency are problems that may also be causing upper respiratory inflammation. All right. um, because the, I think we're getting better and better and better at environmental control and nutritional things, those diseases are kind of, kind of waning, uh, um, becoming historical diseases, although as uh, it's, not, it's not out of the bounds of ordinary when you get outside the major institutions that have laboratory animal care and, and uh, ACLAM certified veterinary help. Um, uh, you know, most of the major institutions now are complying with that, so we tend to get those things that, that decrease those spurious diseases. But nonetheless, I'm sure there are small colleges or high school institutions or things in which you may have <coughs> animals that aren't complying, and you may see those things. So. <coughs> I think we have to keep all our options open as pathologists. Uh, this is an example of, uh, <coughs> of Sendai viral pneumonia um, experimentally produced in, in rats. And what we see here is the pattern of interstitial pneumonia throughout these lungs. <coughs> There's nothing, I think, that singles this out as Sendai. It could be pneumonia virus of mice. Okay. <coughs> Again, this is uh, the microscopic presentation of uh, viral pneumonia um, in, uh, in rat. You can see again here, interstitial pneumonia tends to begin in the hilus. That's true of all species because interstitial pneumonias usually arrive by the vascular route. They often manifest themselves in the hilar portion of the lung first. So here we have one lobe here, the hilar portion of this lung. It has increased density. And sort of up close and personal, uh, you can see that there is, uh, uh, we're sort of at a little bit more chronic phase here, but there is epithelial proliferation and there is chronic Im uh, subacute inflammation. Um, and uh, this looks like a vessel here with a, uh, a lymphoid cuff around it, all right? And that's how, the d how these disease entities tend to, re or uh, 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 are residual in the lung for a while as these lymphoid cuffs remain for a while. And that may be what you see microscopically. And when we, get, when we talk about mice, I'll give you some, uh, I'll, I'll show you the results from a study, a small study that I compiled looking at incidences of those and how we determined that we had an in-house transmission problem rather than um, spurious disease. 
<coughs> okay. <coughs> I'd like to talk, uh, shift the bacterial diseases now of the lung, and clearly, <coughs> clearly the most important uh, uh, bacterial respiratory disease in rats is chronic respiratory disease. Uh, we went through a period of time in which we uh, uh, began to call this uh, murine respiratory mycoplasmosis. We got very fancy with that. And uh, now I think that because there is a second agent, the so-called carbacillus or ciliar-associated uh, ciliar, uh, respiratory bacillus, that causes an absolutely identical disease, both clinically and, and pathologically, um, I think I've gone back to saying chronic respiratory disease because in looking at it, although most of it probably is due to mycoplasma pulmonis, um, some may be caused by carbacillus, and, and it's pretty hard to sort those out. So for me, I've gone back to sort of the old CRD <coughs> designation. It's common. It's widespread. Um, and it's a serious problem, right? There is, there is often a very high incidence but a low morbidity. <coughs> but the mortality acu is cumulative. Okay, this is a disease in which it's, sub it's subclinical, it's subclinical, it's subclinical, and then pretty soon you start seeing some photophobia and maybe some upper respiratory signs, and you get kind of a sense that maybe you've got a problem, and then uh, one rat dies, and what he's got is he's got massive suppurative pneumonia with bronchiectasis and all those lesions. And the problem is, is that, you're, that you have other animals in the colony that are probably moving towards that route, and there's nothing you're going to do about it by, at, at that time. Because by the time they show clinical signs, they're, they're going to die. <coughs> Again, I would point out, and here's an excellent example of tremendous, tremendous strain variability, right? Um, this is a, a disease uh, uh, classically described in Sprague Dolly rats. Sprague Dolly rats are highly susceptible to it. On the other hand, if you're in an institution that's using fisher rats, I have seen literally hundreds of thousands of fisher rats and never, ever seen chronic respiratory disease in a fisher rat. So they are genetically resistant to it. So again, my, in my experience, in my youthful experience as a pathologist, I went out from vet school. Um, <clears throat> if, you ask any, if you ask any senior vet student to name a disease in rats, this is the disease they're going to name. And I went to a large institution which had, again, literally hundreds of thousands of fisher rats, worked there for several years and never, ever saw the disease. So if you'd have asked me by personal experience, um, what's the most common disease in rats, I, I would not have listed chronic respiratory disease, all right? <coughs> um, often the clinical signs, uh, uh, there are none initially. As I indicated, the animals may start to lose some weight. Uh, you may see this red ocular nasal discharge that's common uh, non-response to uh, uh, respiratory infection. Um, and then as the disease becomes more severe, the animals may develop uh, dyspnea or uh, eye rubbing, the signs of ocular uh, irritation, okay? Um, if there is otitis media, uh, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute, the animals may develop a head tilt and in fact, any rat, any, any susceptible strain of rat with a head tilt is likely to have this disease. Either that or he's got a pituitary adenoma. Okay. <coughs> there is a poor correlation between clinical signs and lesions, and that's why sometimes you're often shocked that that animal has begun to show clinical signs. Um, you decide to sacrifice that rat <clears throat> and you open him up, and my God, you know, there's, there's no functional lung tissue, and it's amazing how long he could have gone uh, to see that. So a relatively poor correlation between clinical signs and the lesions. Um, what you may see is uh, um, early, the, les uh, the lesions may be atelectasis, uh, which appear, always appear as uh, dark red and depressed areas in the lung in whatever species we're dealing with. Pulmonary atelectasis looks the same in all species. And then classically, uh, bronchiectasis. And it is this bronchiectasis that separates the disease from Carinobacterium cuchari infection, I, I think. And uh, the bronchiectatic areas, and I'll, as you'll see in the picture in a minute, look like poorly defined nodules rather than well-defined abscesses. And it's a subtle distinction, but I think with time you can be, and experience, you can, you can be confident about it, right? And then uh, the inflammatory response is mucopurulent. 
<clears throat> and again, we're going to contrast that to the strep infection, which we see, which tends to be necrotizing and fibrinopurulent. Okay. <clears throat> Here's a nice example of what atelectasis looks like. Uh, again, uh, we're in the we're sort of in the hyalus here, but but we're in the cranial uh, aspects of these lobes, which Again, cranioventral tends to um, indicate that there is bronchopneumonia present rather than interstitial pneumonia. But you, clearly you can see these areas of depression in the lung. And here is a nice example of, uh, it just doesn't get any nicer than this, I don't think. <coughs> one of the things, <coughs> one of the patterns uh, um, that you see with bronchiectasis is uh, because as the, as the bronchi get larger, uh, they get sort of serpiginous in the, in, and they kind of get wavy, and so they produce almost a linear pattern in the lung. Okay, you can see that these are all linear going in this direction. And, if, and that linearity um, causes almost a symmetrical lesion. That is, the lesions look like they're somewhat organized as opposed to the multifocal random lesions or abscesses that we'll see in, in Carinobacterium cuchari pneumonia. Okay, but nice example, uh, <coughs> and here these are. Uh, these are pretty well different, uh, pretty well demarcated because they're filled with mucopurulent exudate. N not technically abscesses, though. Okay. <coughs> uh, uh, again, you'll notice though that the anterior, uh, uh, this the anterior portion of the lung, is involved preferentially. Although sometimes uh, the lungs and rodents are small enough that it's difficult for us to appreciate hilar distributions versus anterior ventral distributions. We can make that designation much more easily in dogs and, and horses and cattle. Nonetheless, um, it is the cranial and the ventral portions of the lobes that are involved here, and that should give us a hint that bronchopneumonia is the problem here. Okay, <clears throat> what do we see histologically? Well, and it indicated mucopurulent inflammation grossly, and that's what we tend to see uh, microscopically as well. And we may see it not only in the lung, <coughs> but we're going to see it in the nasal cavity and in the middle ear, right? <coughs> lymphoid hyperplasia occurs. And not only does it occur in the defined lymphoid tissue, but it occurs in the bronchio-associated lymphoid tissue, or the so-called BALT. And it, it is a hallmark of mycoplasma infection. And partially that's because the mycoplasmas are nonspecific mitogens that induce a proliferation of lymphocytes. Um, the other things we see uh, in response to the bronchiectasis and necrosis as a nonspecific response is epithelial hyperplasia and squamous metaplasia as the, as the lesions get quite chronic. Okay. <coughs> Here's a nice example of the hyper, uh, hyperplastic response we see in the, in the bronchial, uh, bronchial associated lymphoid tissue or the BALT. Uh, there, is, there is hyperplasia in these uh, mediastinal nodes as well, uh, although not, not quite uh, as, well, I'm sorry, that looks like thymus. Looks like there's, there, there may be a, a lymphoid proliferation in the thymus. Uh, just up close and personal with this, and you can see um, this is clearly a much larger lymphoid nodule than would normally be present, and that's because the mycoplasmas are nonspecific mitogens and stimulate that. <coughs> Here, I think, is, uh, is, a, is a somewhat of a hint about the pathogenesis. What I think about is the pathogenesis of this disease, <coughs> and that is if you look at how remarkably proliferative the lymphocytes are, in this disease, uh, that they impinge upon the airway, and not only that, but I think they destroy, they destroy the, the wall of the airway, and I think in so doing, um, the airways lose their ability to contract and main shape, maintain shape, and so they expand and become ectatic. All right. Um, and here's a, an example of the squamous metaplasia that occur. This, sh this should be, when you think about it, this should be respiratory epithelium, right? It should be pseudostratified, ciliated uh, epithelium, and it's all squamous. <coughs> there are other manifestations, and it may be in your particular experimental protocol, uh, you may be sectioning the nasal cavity. Certainly, when we did the formaldehyde study, we were looking at seven different sections of the nasal cavity. All right, and so you may see 
uh, nasal cavity manifestations of this disease. And in fact, there is mucopurulent exudate in here, which we'll look at. And uh, uh, the nasal lacrimal duct uh, comes down through here. We'll look at that in a minute, and we'll see that there's inflammation in the nasal lacrimal duct. Ah, yeah, see this? So this is the nasal lacrimal duct, which is extending from the conjunctival sac down through the nose. And you can see that there is an inflammatory exudate in here, so the inflammation is contiguous. Um, here is a series to sh point out to you again, cross-section uh, through the whole head. And here's the brain, and here's the middle ear. Here, here's the middle ears, and you can see, you know, this side's got something that this side doesn't have. And what that something is, is this big ball of pus in here. And it looks like it's eroding in here to the eighth cranial nerve, and that is, in fact, what it is doing. <clears throat> and here is the eighth cranial nerve, and here is suppurative exudate, and here is, this is, um, acoustic neuritis, all right? And this animal had a head tilt, and all from mycoplasma. All right, the pathogenesis of this disease <coughs> is strongly associated with ammonia, all right? <coughs> Which is one of the reasons why uh, uh, rodents uh, make, uh, um, make a lot of urine, uh, obviously, the urine is uh, as a strong um, am ammoniacal uh, component to it, and that's why one of the reasons why ventilation or airflow in in rodent rooms is vitally important. It's vitally important to to have sufficient airflow and to direct that airflow so that the animals are not breathing in this ammonia vapor. And the reason why that's important is um, is one of the things ammonia does is cause ciliostasis. So if you produce, if you cause ciliostasis from whatever, <coughs> but certainly in rodent housing, ammonia is one of those things, uh, we have reduced or severely compromised one of the pulmonary clearance uh, mechanisms, and we have provided an opportunity for the mycoplasma to invade and establish themselves. Okay? So we began to see less of this disease when we started to pay attention a close attention to airflow and take care of the air handling uh, properties, and that reduced the incidence of this disease quite a bit. I mentioned that Mycoplasma pulmonis is a potent mitogen, which is why we tend to see uh, lymphoid hyperplasia in the BALT in this disease. And by the way, that's a hallmark of Mycoplasma infection in other species as well. Um, again, I mentioned, I think, that, that uh, uh, part of the pathogenesis is this, is that the lymphoid hyperplasia can be so intense <coughs> and infiltrate the wall of the airway so much so that you destroy that wall, you destroy the muscle, and the wall and, and the airway can't contract anymore and so gradually starts to expand and expand and expand and expand. And I think that may be part of the answer to why we get bronchiectasis. <coughs> And of course, as, as you begin to do that, as the airway begins to dilate, all right, we change the surface area volume relationships in, in that portion of the airway. And uh, um, in so doing, we have now tipped the balance of, of particulates coming in and being, re and being removed by the clearance mechanism, and so that predisposes to bronchopneumonia. And that, in a nutshell, is the uh, um, pathogenesis to uh, chronic respiratory disease. <coughs> I, d I don't want to say a lot about carbacillus. I don't need to, uh, you need to be aware that there is a second bacterial agent, which is a gram-negative filamentous rod that colonizes ciliated epithelium and causes lesions identical, identical to mycoplasma pulmonis. And here is an example of uh, this, uh, um, you need special stains or you need electron microscopy to see the bugs, uh, but what you appreciate here is mucopurulent bronchiolitis, and you have to give that some, some consideration. Here is a silver stain. You can see the, the uh, uh, carbacillus um, sticking right into, adhering right to the cilia on the, on the respiratory mucosa. <coughs> and so there is a hint that uh, you certainly wouldn't see those with uh, uh, mycoplasma. And uh, electron microscopically, uh, you can see how these things are marvelously adapted <coughs> for inserting themselves on these cilia. And sort of, uh, sort of like, you know, they're about the same size as cilia. It's almost as if they're hiding in here. I don't know who they're hiding from. Nonetheless, <coughs> they also, this also inhibits the movement of cilia or, in it or creates ciliostasis. 
uh, just like the, the mycoplasma does. And that's a pretty fundamentally important process. I mean, remember that, that the cilia are, when you think about the, the main defense mechanism in the lung, is a sheet of flypaper being rowed by cilia, right? And, and pulmonary defense or clearance depends upon the stickiness of that flypaper and the action of the cilia moving the flypaper and what's been trapped in the flypaper out of the lung or out of the airway, all right? So anything that's either going to dilute the flypaper or inhibit the flypaper uh, is going gonna, is gonna to interfere with that mechanism. And also, if the rowers, uh, the cilia moving that flypaper is impaired, you're going to get failure of clearance and eventually accumulation of particulates, and you're going to get pneumonia. So that's the pathogenesis of those two. OK, <clears throat> pseudotuberculosis. Pseudotuberculosis is caused by, uh, it's, it's kind of an odd, obtuse name, because pseudotuberculosis may refer to a couple of different diseases, and so there's some confusion. Um, but well-established, uh, caused by Coronabacterium cuchari. Um, I think that, as far as I know, the microbiologists have been busy reclassifying other bacteria and haven't gotten around to this one yet, so it's still permissible to talk about Coronabacterium. Um, it's a disease that occurs in both rats and mice. <clears throat> as, my, as with chronic respiratory disease, it is primarily a subacute respiratory disease in rats. Right? So this is another one of those uh, sort of low morbidity uh, diseases in which subclinical infection is more common than, than uh, um, clinical disease. And you may see it when the animals are stressed or the disease may be enhanced or brought to a clinical level or increased in severity when it's stressed. And animals are stressed. And that experimental manipulation, then, if you, again, you have a low incidence of this, um, it's there, uh, the animals are handling it, and then whatever your experimental regimen may be, um, boom, the animals now begin to express lesions or get disease, and then you get an epizootic. Okay. <clears throat> It's probably uh, an aerosol infection, but when you look at the pattern of disease, as I think is true for, for a number of other carinobacterial diseases in domestic animals, uh, there is a hematogenous spread involved. And so this disease, I think, in my experience, doesn't present as bronchopneumonia. It presents as multifocal abscesses. And that multifocality suggests a hematogenous spread to me. And I could cite other examples. I think that those of you with experience in, with uh, uh, rotococcus infection in horses recognize that there is a two, there's sort of two levels of expression. There is a chronic pulmonary abscess bronchopneumonia syndrome in the older horses, but young foals tend to have a, a, a metastatic shower to the lung. And so I think it may be related to the level of the immune response and, and whatnot. <coughs> Epizootics do occur. I, uh, I, was, I was privileged, I guess, or I guess I was lucky to indirectly have been involved uh, in an epizootic to this disease in, a, in uh, what shall remain an unnamed but major industrial uh, company on the eastern seaboard um, that had this disease. And uh, the inexperienced laboratory animal veterinarian, not, not a certi ACLAM certified in-house veterinarian, but somebody that was sort of came from the outside, made the mistake of trying to treat the disease. And of course, in, in trying to salvage the experiment, and uh, ultimately what happened is, of course, by keeping those animals in the colony, just spread the disease to the other animals in the colony, and they wound up um, spending more money with, r rather than sacrificing the animals and starting the study again. Um, they sort of delayed the agony and eventually wound up spending more money than they would have in the first place. So. <clears throat> Again, the clinical signs uh, that we see are nonspecific. Uh, we may see this, this porphyrin-stained oculonasal discharge or this reddish oculonasal discharge, common in many different uh, respiratory infections. Um, <clears throat> you may see nothing, and then the animals might die. So again, somewhat similar to uh, um, uh, chronic respiratory disease. And I think that carinobacterial agents, as the mycoplasma agents, tend to be agents of low virulence so that you can have lots of infection without uh, creating uh, uh, death. That's not the case with some other higher virulence agents. 
Okay, what do we see uh, grossly? All right, as opposed to chronic respiratory disease, in this case, uh, my experience is that you see miliary to coalescing white foci, which are well demarcated and uh, may be caseopurulent. <clears throat> these, may, these may coalesce to, to involve large portions of the lung, and if they break out into the pleura, you'll see pleural adhesions. And again, I think the pattern indicates that there is hematogenous dissemination of this disease rather than, than uh, classic bronchopneumonia. And here is a nice example. Again, in my experience, I saw a lot of this disease in horses when I was in Texas, in young horses. And I mean, I could, I could take the, uh, the scale bar away from this and, sh and tell you that this was the lung from a foal, and, and you wouldn't know the difference. This is exactly what, what Rhodococcus equi looks like in foals, not, a, not adult horses, but in foals. And again, we have a tendency, you know, what we see here is we see multifocal coalescing uh, white foci, which are a little pyrogranulomatous, or early they're abscesses, and then with time become pyrogranulomatous, okay? And that's the pattern that you expect to see in disseminated disease or hematogenous disease. Clearly, Hopefully, you could differentiate between this and the Mycoplasma pomonas uh, bronchiectasis lesion. And here's one that's, uh, that's gone a long time, and we've got clearly, uh, uh, th th there's been coalescence. I mean, look at these lungs again. Uh, far advanced disease, um, a sense that there's some abscesses here, but in, in some respects, the whole lung is an abscess by now. Uh, histologically, again, uh, um, what we see with, uh, para, uh, uh, with uh, pseudotuberculosis is coagulative to liquefactive necrosis early that becomes uh, suppurative and then it uh, um, progresses to pyogranulomatous with time. No giant cells, no mineralization. And if you suspect that you're dealing with this disease, the nice thing is, is that they're gram-positive short rods that can be well visualized by the appropriate uh, um, gram stain or special stain. <coughs> and uh, here's an example of, uh, of uh, a carinobacterial, again, some, uh, uh, the, the, the microscopic or the subgross from the gross that we looked at. You can see there's lots of individual little pyogranulomatous foci here. Looks like there's some lymphoid hyperplasia in the hyalur nodes, should, should be expected. And again, this is, in fact, this is case material from that industrial outbreak that I mentioned to you. Uh, and again, lo look at these uh, discrete areas of uh, pyogranulomatous inflammation um, <coughs> that are coalescing. Yeah, I don't know whether it's coincidence or not that it's right next to this vessel, but uh, again, um, this, this looks a little bit different than, uh, uh, it's not in an airway. Um, a typical pyogranulomatous focus in the lung, not an airway, so not a bronchi, uh, not an ectatic airway. And then when we're uh, appropriately stained with a brown brin, uh, um, you, can, you can make out the gram positive rods here. So there's one that you can relatively easily, definitively diagnose. Okay, a disease that uh, um, probably isn't as common as it used to be is uh, streptococcal pneumonia. This tends to uh, occur um, as an acute epizootic disease in young rats. It's, uh, it may be part of the normal nasopharyngeal flora that, that is kept in check by normal immune mechanisms, and then when the animals may be stressed, or suffer immunosuppression from stress or some protocol manipulation, boom, you know, their immunity may go down to the point where this uh, uh, pathogen can establish itself, and then uh, it may be spread by aerosol and, uh, and spread to other uh, animals. <coughs> okay, the clinical signs associated with this, again, are the nonspecific signs associated with upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, rhinitis, mucoperial and discharge. Uh, uh, we may see this porphyrin-stained oculonasal discharge. 
Uh, the animals may be snuffling and there may be some dyspnea, so, so clearly the clinical side of you would recognize that maybe the animals um, uh, are experiencing respiratory difficulty. And they often die within a few days. And uh, what you see grossly here is a little bit different than uh, the two previous respiratory diseases, and that is we tend to see fibrinopurulent bronchopneumonia with pleuritis and pericarditis. It really, it's, it's the shipping fever. Uh, it, it looks like pastorella, <clears throat> somewhat like pastorella that we would see in ruminants, okay? It's very effusive. So no bronchiectasis, uh, no chronicity, um, no uh, ectasia, but uh, um, diffuse exudative uh, pneumonia. And uh, as streptococcal diseases in other animals, as you know from other animals, uh, there may be hematogenous dissemination to meninges, so you may see um, suppurative meningitis, and we may see lesions in liver, kidney, and joints, and uh, that, that's less common in my experience than the pulmonary infection. <clears throat> Histologically, what we see is acute exudative pneumonia that is rich in fibrin and neutrophils and uh, erythrocytes. Again, it would be very similar to what we would see with pasturella, like a shipping fever in, uh, in uh, bovine, or uh, strep pneumonia in pigs. Again, here, uh, the key here is no abscesses. And uh, it's not very common, <coughs> and uh, here's an example of, uh, of uh, a, a necropsy, and uh, what we're looking at here is the lungs and the heart and everything just, just covered with fibrinous exudate. So again, this would be unusual uh, um, in the other two diseases that we looked at. Um, here's an animal with uh, purulent rhinitis that has a strep infection. Um, this is what the, the subgross looks like. Uh, again, we see there's no tendency towards ectasia or abscess formation, but this is just diffuse fibrinopurulent uh, pneumonia. And again, this is a sort of up close. I mean, here is necrotizing bronchiolitis and fibrinopurulent uh, inflammation and uh, alveoli from the same. So necrosis, fibrin, neutrophils, lots of destruction. <coughs> Okay, um, mycotic and parasitic diseases, which will be the next consideration, and uh, the first one I like to talk about is uh, so-called pneumocystis carinii, and uh, it's nice that I've sort of lumped mycotic and parasitic together because there seems to be some controversy about whether pneumocystis is a fungus or a protozoal parasite. Um, I think that the people that are doing uh, um, looking at RNA analysis and RNA homologies, um, believe that, that this animal now, or this thing now, looks like it falls out more with the fungi with, than with the protozoa. There's lots about uh, um, the reproductive aspects of this and the life cycle of this that mimic a protozoal parasite. Anyway, <coughs> it, is a, uh, it is a very commonly occurring latent infection in rats some extent also in mice, and clinical expression usually relates to immune suppression. <coughs> so, so again, immunocompromise, we've learned a lot about this disease since the advent of AIDS in humans. Um, and in fact, a lot of these opportunistic infections uh, um, that we look, used to look at as being sort of unusual, sporadic uh, diseases, I think since the advent in AIDS and our understanding of immune suppression, um, has brought to light many of these diseases and helped us understand the pathogenesis of them uh, uh, quite a lot. <coughs> um, the clinical signs of this disease uh, are, are vague. Um, severely affected animals may exhibit dyspnea, but I will tell you in my experience, um, I even spent some time a number of years ago trying to reproduce this disease so that we could uh, get grant money to, stu to study this. And uh, um, I had, we had animals on uh, the classic immunosuppressive doses of corticosteroids, 
and we were actually, we were able to produce Carinobacterium cuteri infection very successfully, but never produced pneumocystis pneumonia. And in my experience in the disease uh, is that it's occurred as sporadic areas of uh, inflammation in the lung, but we've never produced enough disease um, to cause clinical, uh, to, cl to cause clinical signs, okay? Um, the gross pathology in, in the uh, um, prolonged, uh, uh, in, the, in the really severe cases, is that of an interstitial pneumonia. The lungs are enlarged and firm and rubbery. Um, and histologically, we see um, the signs of interstitial pneumonia that is thickened alveolar septi that are, uh, uh, have increased cellularity. The, the characteristic lesion in this disease, though, is this eosinophilic foamy alveolar fluid. And uh, usually, uh, you can't see the yeast-like organisms without special stains, but you see these multiple foci of this foamy eosinophilic fluid, and your level of suspicion that this is pneumocystis pneumonia should go way up. <coughs> okay. And here's an example of one of these uh, foci, all right? So multiple alveoli involved. Looks like there's some pycnotic debris in here and some uh, sort of cero, uh, cirrus, uh, serofibrinous exudate, but not a lot of inflammation. Uh, just up close and personal, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, the, uh, the bug does cause damage to uh, type 1 pneumocytes, all right? And, and uh, I think the pathogenesis of this disease, uh, um, now here, here's an example of, uh, with a sp special stains, you can see that the, this is uh, one, uh, this is a reproductive uh, phase of the organism, and these are sort of spent shells of that, okay? But anyway, with, with the pr appropriate uh, gram methenamine silver stain, uh, you can see organisms. Um, <clears throat> the pathogenesis of the disease, I think, has worked out pretty well, and, and that's partly because the disease is such a common and devastating uh, um, manifestation in acquired immunodeficiency syndrome in humans uh, that we've come to know more about it. It is a latent infection. Probably clinical disease occurs uh, when there is failure to uh, uh, clear the infection. Uh, the organisms then proliferate. Uh, they do attach. We do know that they form an attachment to type 1 epithelial cells and cause degeneration and exfoliation. And as you may remember, the real barrier in the air blood barrier, all right, I mean, the air blood barrier represents capillary endothelial cell, a very thin, very dry, nascent interstitial space. <clears throat> and then on the other side of that barrier is the, is the type 1 pneumocyte. And the type 1 pneumocytes are locked together very tightly, <clears throat> and that's really the barrier, so that there is some circulation of, of uh, plasma in the interstitial space, but it's rapidly sucked up by the, uh, by the uh, lymphatic system because it's, because it's very important for the lung to be dry, all right? <clears throat> if anything that happens that loosens the, that very tight cell-to-cell -cell junction of the type 1 pneumocytes, will now allow flooding of alveolar, uh, of the alveoli with edema fluid. And that's very important in the pathogenesis of this disease because we know that the pneumocystis organisms cause that damage and the cells contract a little bit and open that space up. And so that's why we get tremendous leakage of plasma um, into the lung. <coughs> the animal, uh, uh, the, the, the agent is of relatively low virulence. All right, so, I mean, it's, it, you know, how it causes this damage, we don't know. But we, uh, uh, from what we know about the clinical disease in humans is that, th that humans that die of this disease um, at autopsy, they have nearly 100% of the lung involved with this, okay, as opposed to, let's say, in streptococcal pneumonia, um, because streptococcal streptococci secrete an exotoxin, you have one lung lobe that is involved, and that may be enough to cause death. <coughs> Whereas I think that, that um, the cause of death in this is respiratory insufficiency. That's why these patients last a long time. You can clear the infection a little bit, and they can get back to uh, um, some sort of respiratory capacity. So it's very much a chronic disease of respiratory insufficiency, and death is not caused until, until almost the entire lung is, is uh, overwhelmed. I think that's why uh, we don't see a lot of clinical pneumocystis carinii in rodents, because it never gets to that point. Okay. 
All right, just a brief note about neoplasms. Uh, primary lung tumors in rats are relatively rare. You may see uh, lots of bizarre metastases. Uh, this animal has, this is a metastatic C-cell carcinoma in the lung. Um, here's an example of a, of an ep, a trico, ep, a malignant trichoepithelioma from the skin that metastasized to the lung. So again, we talked about rare things. Um, rare things happen, and you will see them. <clears throat> and just a couple of miscellaneous uh, uh, problems in the lung. This is an example of corn oil aspiration. And animals that are being gavaged in uh, corn oil vehicles, you put the gavage needle in the wrong, down the wrong tube, and you squirt that corn oil in there, and the animals go <gasps> like this, and that aspiration kills them. And what you see is this refractal stuff in the alveoli out by the, the uh, pleural, because when they gasp like that, it sucks the corn oil out to the margins. And then lastly, uh, um, here's an example of heat prostration. And um, the lesions of heat prostration is just visceral congestion. But this is a consideration if you live in, uh, in tropical or hot climates, and these, uh, the animals arrive on the shipping dock, and they sit there on the box for, out there on the dock for a while, and they'll overheat and die. So not a problem for the guys in Anchorage, but I can tell you I've seen this in Houston. So, all right, shall we take a break? The second disease, uh, or the second uh, organ system uh, we'll consider is the gastrointestinal tract, and obviously the gastrointestinal illnesses uh, are important in, uh, in rats, uh, which is why we'll consider it now. Um, starting with the viral diseases, uh, there aren't many viral diseases uh, in the rat uh, uh, GI tract that are important, uh, but cytomegalovirus, uh, uh, which is a herpes virus, is certainly one of them. Um, this, again, tends to be a, uh, a latent, usually subclinical infection, in my experience, of the salivary glands. Um, and uh, generally, there's no disease, but there are, there are um, mild, there's mild non-suppurative uh, uh, adenitis. And this, this is likely to be an incidental finding for you. And what you typically see would be interna uh, intranuclear inclusions or cytomegalovirus inclusions. Um, uh, in epithelial cells, and here's an example of, uh, of uh, just such an example of this. Um, again, the animal was clinically normal, but uh, in screening the tissues, uh, um, <coughs> um, <coughs> neoplasm, uh, again, uh, bacterial diseases, uh, um, just let me briefly mention that uh, there is Tizer's disease and, and salmonellosis, which I'm going to cover in detail in, in mice because the material that I have is more referable to mice. Um, mycotic and parasitic diseases, again, are similar to the mouse um, in that there is uh, Giardia, Spironucleus, pinworms, and Hymenelopus, but I'm going to cover those uh, when we look at mice again. Neoplasms are uncommon. 
um, with the possible exception of uh, colonic adenocarcinoma in Wistar first rats. And uh, I mention this because there is a very high frequency and uh, the Wistar Firth the colonic adenocarcinoma might be a, a model for uh, the similar analogous disease in human beings, so it may be useful in that regard. <coughs> um, uh, we've sort of jumped all the way in the gastrointestinal tract uh, to uh, uh, miscellaneous diseases, and certainly one of them is malocclusion, which is what is uh, uh, pictured here. Uh, the hepatobiliary, uh, um, uh, hepatobiliary system is the next system uh, I'll consider, and uh, we'll start with the viral diseases again. And uh, the viral disease uh, of choice uh, is the uh, kill em rat virus. Uh, uh, which is a parvovirus. This is also, in, in some of the literature, you'll see this uh, um, indicated as Tulin's H1 virus. Um, um, the typical uh, 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 response, uh, again, it's a, it tends to be a latent disease with subclinical infection. There may be sporadic disease among neonates and sucklings. Because it's a parvovirus, all right, like all parvoviruses, it has a predilection for rapidly proliferating cells. And so we tend to see the uh, lesion expression um, in organs and tissues in which there is rapid turnover, okay? Um, one of these organs in neonates is the liver, hence why we see uh, parvoviral hepatitis uh, in the rat liver, okay? And histologically, what we'll see is uh, hepatocellular degeneration and necrosis with intranuclear inclusions, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, this disease tends to be clinically severe or more severe in animals between 6 and 12 days of age, and then after 12 days of age, it becomes a self-limiting hepatitis. And here is an example of, uh, of a sort of a nonspecific hepatitis in a neonatal rat. And uh, hopefully we'll focus in on, yeah, here are the, here's the internuclear inclusion, nice parvoviral inclusion in this rat. Uh, there is a manifestation of this disease in the central nervous system, which we'll get to when I talk about central nervous system lesions. Okay, bacterial diseases. Um, uh, and the differential diagnosis for bacterial diseases, and again, we're going to talk about bacterial diseases uh, um, in more detail when we uh, cover mice, um, but the bacterial diseases to include uh, in hepatitis, causing hepatitis is pseudotuberculosis, which causes abscesses, uh, Tizer's disease, which tends to cause acute necrosis, and salmonellosis. Those would be the common bacterial disease problems uh, causing hepatitis in the liver. Uh, a note, uh, salmonellosis is ve can be very common in mice, but not common in rats. Okay, um, in the classification of mycotic and parasitic diseases, um, uh, certainly one is Cystocircus fasciolaris which is the intermediate stage of the cat tapeworm Tinea tineiformis, And that makes sense that cats eat small rodents and that the rat should be an intermediate host uh, for this uh, parasite. It's an, it tends to be an uncommon incidental finding in lab rats, as you might guess, um, because the transmission requires the consumption of the egg stage by the rat, all right? Um, when one f begins to find too many of these in one's rat colony, um, it's time to call Charles Rivers and uh, discuss with them how they're raising rats because they have to get access to cat feces. And so it, it clearly represents an, an unsound housing practice problem when you've got cat tapeworms in your rat liver, all right? Um, there are, in my experience, it's usually single, but there may be multiple. I have seen livers in which there are multiple cystocircus uh, um, in the liver. But uh, here's an example of one that's, uh, um, they tend to be discrete uh, um, 
a sort of uh, 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 the bladder worm is a, is a sac uh, filled with uh, edema fluid and the, and the scolex. Uh, and microscopically, when you section that, this is what you see. Uh, it's an encapsulated uh, fluid mass with a larval stage of the tapeworm in that, OK? <coughs> There's no, other than the fact that it compresses the, the liver parenchyma, there probably is no functional significance to this, at least in the sporadic cases. And probably even in the, um, in the heavily infested cases, there probably is no adverse effect on the animal because the liver has a marvelous amount of physiological reserve and some regenerative capacity. So um, there's not a lot of virulence associated with these. It's a space-occupying lesion. There is some evidence, uh, um, as occurs in a number of different parasitic infections, there is some evidence that uh, these uh, cystocircus may induce fibrosarcomas in the liver. So there's some of that, but I, I'm not, I don't think it's a real common problem. Uh, the other parasitic infection uh, that uh, occurs uh, is capillaria hepatica. And this also is uncommon in laboratory rats, uh, although both this and the previous uh, parasitic disease would be more common in feral rats. Um, again, because uh, the acquisition of the parasite requires consumption of infected liver, um, one, one has a, a legitimate basis uh, to discuss the quality of the animals that you're purchasing from whoever your supplier is if you see too much capillary hepatica in your animal colony. All right. This is a typical appearance of these um, bipolar eggs. Uh, there's almost nothing else uh, that causes this in rats that I can think of. Uh, neoplasms, um, hepatocellular carcinomas are quite common in rats. Uh, the, the terminology is confusing, and I'm not going to go over it here because uh, um, somebody comes along and rechanges the classification of these uh, every few years. But suffice to say, that uh, um, there is a gradation of these from basophilic foci or clear cell foci to neoplastic nodules to adenomas to carcinomas. There's a regular progression about which we argue the terminology, but the fact is is that there is lots of uh, um, uh, malignant transformation going on in the rodent liver. Um, many of the uh, xenobiotics that uh, rats will metabolize uh, um, in studies uh, um, may re are metabolized in the liver and so stimulate this. So, so hepatic uh, tumors in livers are quite common and, and you'll have to deal with uh, their incidence and, and classification at a later time. I, I've just included one example. This, is a, this would be a typical full-blown hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, uh, uh, as in many species, the carcinomas tend to be pretty well differentiated. I've had experience, uh, just recently had experience um, in my biopsy practice uh, that uh, in a really well differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma, if the clinician or the surgeon takes a small piece of tissue and he takes only tumor tissue without history, you may have a difficult time diagnosing the fact that there's a tumor because it looks so well differentiated. So often, if you have adjacent liver next to it that's normal, you can see that contrast. Uh, shouldn't be a problem for you with rodents because you kind of get to pick and choose what you look at. You get to see the whole liver, so diagnosis shouldn't be a problem. The nervous system, next. And uh, in considering, uh, we'll start with viral diseases in the nervous system. And I'll pick up with the kill em rat virus or the parvovirus, uh, um, as we talked about in hepatitis. Um, this is a disease that occurs in rats only, so it's species specific. Uh, generally occurs in uh, adults and weanlings. Um, and it's a situation, again, where infection is common, but, but clinical disease is sporadic. And usually uh, what we have is latent infection that's reactivated by immunosuppression. Okay. Um, it is a viral infection that crosses the placenta, so it creates the possibility of, of vertical infection. And uh, in, the produ in production colonies, uh, we haven't talked too much about what you see in production colonies, but decreased production. That is, if you're in the rat-making business um, and you notice that there is a decrease in production, um, that's often a sign that there's a problem, right? Well, there are lots of things that can result in that, of course. But infectious disease should be in the, in the uh, um, list of things that you would be looking at. Um, the animals, uh, the animals may get icteric if they have hepatitis associated with this. And, and if they have uh, uh, CNS or have encephalitis, then you may see ataxia. 
Again, uh, um, as with most parvoviruses, um, the virus has a, a preference for mitotically active cells, which explains the distribution of the disease. Um, in this case, uh, um, there is cerebellar hypoplasia, and there may be intranuclear inclusions in the cerebellum, and that's because this, at, at the time they're infected, the cerebellum may be actively uh, proliferating. Um, my experience uh, um, with this is uh, um, this so-called hemorrhagic encephalopathy. There has been some things in the literature in the past uh, 10 years or so describing this. Um, I don't know that there's anything specific about this. There is, we know that there is a viral tropism for the endothelial cells that causes endothelial damage and uh, thrombosis, and the thrombosis probably is the basis for this hemorrhagic encephalopathy as it tends to be infarctive. Okay. And there, are, there you may see inclusion bodies in the endothelium. Again, I wish I had uh, I wish I had slide material to show you uh, in color. This is this is black and white uh, of uh, 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 the dorsal surface of a rat brain with hemorrhagic encephalopathy. But certainly, you can see the extent of hemorrhage over the cerebral hemispheres. <clears throat> and here, that also extends to the spinal cord. Here is severe hemorrhage in the spinal cord in this disease. There's almost nothing else that does this that I'm aware of. And uh, here, there's nothing special about this, again, that, th that there is um, probably this separation here represents uh, necrosis from, is from ischemia, and probably some of that is handling artifact, but nonetheless, it indicates that, you know, carefully handled normal uh, brain tissue shouldn't do that. So here, all of this um, congestion and hemorrhage is all secondary to... Uh, uh, the disease. And uh, here is a nice example of endoth endothelial necrosis. There's no inclusion bodies here, but there's clearly endothelial necrosis in this specimen, um, which is uh, virally mediated and probably is the pathogenesis for thrombosis and then ischemia. And uh, uh, again, similar in the spinal cord here, there is hemorrhage and there is lots of um, edema in the white matter here. Okay, uh, bacterial diseases, uh, again, the uh, bacterial diseases in the uh, uh, central nervous system of rats are not particularly common. Um, uh, I, uh, I mentioned the Carinobacterium. Uh, um, Carinobacterium is going to causes metastatic disease nearly everywhere. And again, we'll discuss that with mice a little bit. And uh, let me point out that o otitis media, um, uh, partly respiratory, partly nervous system, but uh, otitis media as a function of um, mycoplasmal pulmonis infection should be considered. Um, when we get down to mycotic and parasitic diseases, um, we have a tendency to think of encephalitozoan uh, as being a, uh, a, the more common uh, um, disease in rabbits, but I would point out for you that encephalozoan has been reported in rats and mice as well. And here's a relatively typical, for those of you that have seen this in rabbits, you would recognize this lesion is the same wherever it occurs. Um, here's a typical encephalodozoan lesion in the brain of, uh, of uh, uh, a rat. So I've seen it in rats and mice and rabbits, although clearly far more common in rabbits. Um, not very common in, in small rodents. It uh, doesn't seem to have any clinical significance, any more so in uh, rats than it does in rabbits. Anyway, be aware that it does occur. Um, <clears throat> neoplastic diseases in rats are probably more common than probably reported. Um, there are, uh, uh, in my experience, I've seen the entire gamut of, uh, of uh, brain tumors uh, in rats. Um, this one happens to be a metastatic, uh, this one is a metastatic uh, mammary adenocarcinoma. Um, I'm not sure that grossly you can sort too many of these out, okay? So you definitely need histopathology to sort those out. A, a relatively, uh, um, amongst the tumors that are occurring in the central nervous system, one of the common ones is the so-called granular cell tumor. It used to be called granular cell myoblastoma um, because of, uh, of uh, 
purported uh, um, origin um, from myoblasts, and now it looks like it's likely coming from a from a, uh, a nerve sheath uh, origin or something like that. It's probably a nerve origin tumor, but these uh, tend to occur as solitary, well circumscribed um, masses, usually in the cerebral or the cerebellar meninges. And uh, I mean, here's a, a smaller one, uh, but they uh, tend to be uh, um, sheets of large oval cells with abundant cytoplasm uh, that contains eosinophilic uh, PAS positive granules. And uh, therein lies the ability to make a good diagnosis. I guess I don't have a, uh, I guess I don't have a uh, PAS on one of these things, but these things just absolutely light up. The granules light up with PAS. And again, then uh, uh, glial tumors, uh, probably all the different glial tumors. Astrocytoma probably is, in my experience, uh, which tends to be more focused in fisher rats than in the other breeds, but uh, they're all represented, uh, um, you know, sp sporadically. Okay, we get down to miscellaneous diseases. Uh, certainly an important miscellaneous disease of rats is uh, photoreceptor degeneration or so-called uh, retinal degeneration or retinal atrophy. And um, this is uh, light intensity uh, and, and light duration and uh, uh, temperature related. So those are the variables. Uh, expect to see about 10% of the rats at two years of age with this disease under normal circumstances. Again, at an institution that I, one institution that I had worked at, um, uh, one the pathologist uh, began uh, reading the study um, saw an, uh, a tremendous in increase in the incidence of this disease and went back, uh, retrospectively went back and looked at the study records and we determined that, that the animal handlers forgot to rotate the cages on the racks. And so 100% of the animals that were on the upper racks had retinal atrophy. And then there were proportionately lower, uh, um, the, the lower animals. And so that, that's how we went back and, and discovered that. And if you don't, that's one of the reasons which we rotate those cages on the racks, because the animals that are higher up, closer to the ceiling, are going to get more incident light, and they're going to have a higher incidence of retinal degeneration. Fortunately, fortunately, the cages were mixed so that the high-dose animals weren't on the top rack, and the intermediate dose on the middle, and the low dose on the low. Otherwise, we might have had a problem interpreting that, right? I mean, we might have killed a chemical or a compound because of what it did to the animals on the top shelf. So again, I mean, you just have to be aware of all of these things a little bit. Okay. Um, which, and, and again, just uh, so to appreciate the, mag uh, the magnitude of the change that you see, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, a normal uh, rat retina, and this is what you see. This is what it's down to. Okay, this is the entire retina. And again, I'll let you go back and look at that again so that you can appreciate I mean, here's the sort of normal 10 layers, and here is the, here's this photoreceptor layer, and then uh, boom, <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's what's left. So there is tremendous, tremendous atrophy in these retinas. And uh, again, um, another uh, uh, very common and very important uh, late onset uh, nervous system disease uh, in rats is spontaneous uh, radiculoneuropathy. And uh, this is primarily a segmental, it's a segmental primary demyelinization of the ventral nerve roots and, and preferentially in the lumbosacral cord and the, and the uh, um, cauda equina. It occurs in uh, aged rats, and you can see that in some, in some strains of animals, three quarters to 90% of the animals um, at 24 months of age uh, will, be, uh, will have lesions related to this disease. Um, the clinical signs, uh, if it gets to the stage where the animals have clinical signs, are posterior paresis and paralysis with skeletal muscle atrophy. Okay. 
Histologically, the lesions are quite characteristic. There is myelin sheath swelling. There's demyelination. We may see uh, macrophages uh, with axonophagia, uh, if it's severe enough, and cystic spaces in the myelinated nerves. Okay. And here is a, uh, here's a, a very nice example of this that came to me from a colleague in, uh, at a pharmaceutical company in Japan. Um, and uh, no one's going to have any trouble diagnosing this. So this is a Luxol Fast blue stain. And you can see all of these big, large, dilated axonal sheath swelling with, with uh, axonal degeneration or axon dropout. We may have a macrophage or two in there sort of gobbling this up. And this is, I think, uh, a ventral root from uh, the sacrum, just up close and personal. Again, you can see loss of uh, loss of axons here. Okay, see here, these are the uh, axons, big cystic spaces. Okay, pathogenesis is undetermined. All right, urinary system. <clears throat> um, viral diseases of the urinary system, none, of which that I'm aware. Um, we get down to bacterial diseases of the nervous system. Um, the kidney is not an uncommon place to find Carinobacterium cuchari. And uh, the way, again, the way, if you remember the pathogenesis of carinobacterial infection, it tends to be hematogenous dissemination of the, of the organisms. So you may expect to not only see the pneumonia that we see, but you may see metastatic or septic abscesses in, in distant or in other organs. And liver and kidney um, are two of the common uh, um, places that you see that. Uh, here's an, a cross-section of a kidney, uh, and we'll get close in a minute, but you can see multifocal uh, um, cortical areas of density. And again, um, in looking at the cross-section of a kidney, uh, the, the, where the lesion is tells me something about the pathogenesis, okay? If I see, and this would be true of, of for any species, if I see lesions that are in the medulla, or in the lower portion of the kidney, I need to be thinking about ascending processes, right? Whereas if, I, if the lesions are, are centered in the cortex, well, the, way I can get, the only way I can get into the cortex of the kidney is by the vascular route, okay? So uh, hematogenous spread to the kidney, um, or, uh, and you know this from your experience with suppurative embolic nephritis, and that really is what this is in a sense, those lesions tend to occur predominantly in the cortex. So here's a, a, a Carinobacterium uh, cuchari kidney in which the lesions are predominantly in the cortex. And here we are up close and personal. Um, the response, again, in the kidney is similar to what it is in the lung. It's pyrogranulomatous inflammation. And often there are bacteria present uh, um, that can be easily visualized and stained. And here are bacteria present here. Uh, mycotic and parasitic diseases, again, not common in the, uh, in the rat urinary tract, but uh, there is a nematode called Trichosomoides crassicauda, which is a cap, which is a group, it belongs to the capillaria group, or it's a capillariid. And uh, like many capillarias, um, it, it sows itself, or in situ, uh, its habitat is within the epithelial layer, within the epithelial layer. All right, so you'll see that that this is that it forms little galleries or channels within the epithelium, and because it's marginally invasive, there is marginal response to it. <clears throat> so when you think, if you think about it from the standpoint of the parasite, um, it's almost living in the host, but it's not living in it too much, and so it's not stimulating too much rejection or an immune response. There tends to be maybe a little uh, uh, lymphoplasmacytic inflammation associated with it, but not much, and so because it's not causing much damage, it's not causing much response, it's not causing much disease. And those are, of course, the ideal or the hallmarks of a successful parasite, or a parasite that's there, but kind of not, not causing too much damage or risking being rejected.
Anyway, it's a sporadic. Uh, you may, uh, if, if, if uh, urinalysis is being done, you may see the eggs in the urine, and that may alert you to the fact that, that the, there are parasites in the wall of the bladder, in the epithelial area of the bladder, but they generally do not cause uh, um, much disease or much of a lesion. Um, you're familiar with the capillary aplica in the dog urinary bladder. I mean, it's a related parasite. Uh, those of you that have experience um, with uh, macaques know that, that it's uh, anatricosoma is a related parasite that occurs in the nasal mucosa. So there's a whole family of these parasites that are sort of epithelial uh, um, parasites and don't cause a lot of damage. <coughs> <clears throat> Neoplasms are relatively uncommon. Um, nephroblastomas and renal carcinomas do occur sporadically. Uh, th the exception is in uh, brown Norway rats have a high frequency of transitional cell carcinomas. Um, for instance, uh, uh, the male brown Norways uh, um, may have a 28 percent after two years. 28 percent may have bladder tumors, and six percent may have ureteral transitional cell tumors. And in the females, um, about two percent have bladder tumors, but 20 percent have ureteral tumors. So the brown Norway rat may be a good model for transitional cell carcinoma. And I don't know what's being done with that recently, but uh, uh, certainly at one time it had that potential. Uh, when we get to miscellaneous diseases of the rat, certainly this is a disease that everybody who, who has even marginal experience with rats will understand, and that uh, is uh, chronic progressive nephropathy or chronic renal disease. It is a major disease problem of rats. It's probably more important than, than chronic respiratory disease uh, is. It's an age-related condition in many strains. Um, <clears throat> And uh, um, there seems to be a strong correlation with the, la with the lab chow diet that is high in protein. Now, there's a lot going on right now in uh, rodent nutrition about, about protein calorie restriction and calorie restriction and whether or not you know, these fat, the fat rats that we produce on this uh, high caloric diet is an appropriate model in the bioassay or not. Okay? And certainly, there has been some research, research to show that if you control the protein content in the diet, you may be able to decrease the, the uh, uh, progression and onset and severity of this disease. Okay, so certainly um, there are nutritional aspects of it. Okay, there may be a relationship to prolactin as well. Okay, not, not quite as well worked out. But the disease may begin as early as three to six months of age. All right. <clears throat> it may begin, you may begin to see the disease at three to six months of age, so it doesn't take long for you to see that. And in terms of clinical signs, I mean, you won't see any clinical signs, uh, typical uh, clinical signs um, in terms of animal behavior and things, but if, the, if protein, if uh, urinalysis is being evaluated, the animals will begin to lose protein, and they lose enormous volumes of protein, okay? And then eventually, if it gets really bad, I mean, they'll have all the signs of chronic renal failure. They'll have uh, elevated BUNs and creatinines, and they'll get hypertensive and have ascites and uh, begin to uh, have the uh, lesions of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, <clears throat> what we see grossly, uh, the kidneys become pale. Uh, they get kind of a pale yellow discoloration. They may be sort of pitted and irregular and have a granular appearance. You may see little cysts. There may be cystic dilatation of tubules, okay? And microscopically, uh, the microscopic picture and the electron microscopic picture is dominated by thickened basement membranes, dilated tubules, glomerular sclerosis, and fibrosis and uh, lymphoplasmacytic interstitial nephritis. I mean, these are all very common lesions that we're used to seeing in chronic uh, renal failure in, uh, in companion animal patients, okay? So some of this just kind of all goes together, I think. Here's a nice example of what uh, um, Again, I, I, I wish I had sort of normal kidneys. You have to remember that normally the kidney is sort of a kidney color or a liver color, and this is way too pale. 
and uh, um, you know the surface is pitted and there are small cysts and that small pitting uh, creates this kind of granular, kind of wet granular appearance, and I'm assuming, I'm, I'm sure the yellowish appearance probably is related to fibrous connective tissue and edema fluid and, and uh, all of those things. And microscopically, uh, th there is some cystic dilatation here. Uh, we're not at a low enough level that we can appreciate uh, the change, but uh, subgrossly. But then we get down microscopically. There is, as you would guess, in any animal uh, uh, experience, sig experiencing significant proteinuria, uh, there you'll see lots of hyaline casts. Uh, and there is thickening of the, uh, Hopefully, we're going to see thickening of basement membranes. There's some glomerular sclerosis. And here's this background, um, non-suppurative interstitial nephritis. Yeah, look, at the, look at the thickened basement membranes. Okay. So again, a little bit of interstitial fibrosis. I mean, this has a little bit of everything in it. And then here is electron micro, uh, the electron microscope uh, indicating this is of the glomerulus. And then look at, uh, look at the uh, tremendous uh, basement membrane thickening. And there's some foot process fusion here. So uh, this is all what goes into the um, glomerular sclerosis. And, and it's the damage to this glomerular filter that uh, um, permits the proteinuria. Um, there are some incidental uh, um, urinary tract uh, besides uh, chronic progressive nephropathy, and one of those would be uh, that, that uh, um, like our small, uh, like canine patients, cystic calculi is uh, some kinds, uh, sometimes a sporadic uh, problem. They tend to be more frequent in Sprague dollies and in uh, Osborne Mendel rats. There may be some relationship between this and transitional cell carcinoma. It's un I think it's uncertain at this time. Uh, certainly, we'll see um, obstructive uh, nephropathies. Uh, here are some hydronephrosis and hydrourator. Um, again, this this would be an incidental, obviously, an incidental uh, finding. This animal does have functional renal tissue and is probably able to maintain normal homeostasis with a one kidney. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you get infection in these things, and then we'll get uh, uh, pyelonephritis and pyoureter and uh, suppurative inflammation in the bladder as well. And an incidental uh, finding, again, in, uh, in corn oil studies uh, is periodically you'll see uh, lipid uh, um, emboli in uh, um, the glomeruli. You may see lipid emboli elsewhere as well. But uh, animals that are on a high uh, fat or high lipid diet may, be, uh, um, may s suffer the consequences of that. I don't know that there's any clinical significance to it. But again, it's something you need to be aware of when you're looking at studies, uh, um, you know, if uh, this pops up in your, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it better be in it better be in the appropriate uh, percentages in the control animals as in the high dose for you to have a clear feeling of the significance of it. Cardiovascular system. <clears throat> okay, there are no viral diseases that are especially impact the cardiovascular system. Um, there are some bacterial diseases, and again, I, I'm going to discuss uh, Tizzer's disease uh, in more depth uh, in mice, but, but remember that rats get Tizzer's disease as well. Um, although we, tend to, we have a tendency to think of Tizzer's as being an enterohepatitis, which it is predominantly, clearly there are reported um, cases of uh, Tizzer's myocarditis, and uh, you're looking at one right here. I don't know if you can appreciate that there are um, the, the manifestation is quite similar. I mean, there is histiocytic inflammation, probably some regenerative uh, a change here, but uh, you look for the little uh, basophilic haystacks within myocardial cells. I don't know if I have a... Yeah, <clears throat> and clearly there are, there are Tizzer's organisms in this myocardial cell here, okay? So um, be aware that uh, um, Tizzer's can express in the heart <clears throat> as well in the more common uh, um, areas, uh, liver and intestinal tract. Uh, the, other uh, the other bacterial disease, uh, <coughs> as you would guess, would be Carinobacterium cuchari. And uh, this is an example of, uh, <coughs> this is an example of Carinobacterial uh, cuchari uh, um, abscesses in the heart. 
this was from an experimental case that I uh, generated uh, um, was when I was trying to I was trying to make pneumocystis, and what I made was uh, uh, pseudotuberculosis. But a tremendous, uh, <clears throat> tremendous uh, myocardial necrosis and inflammation uh, related to metastatic uh, disease, and, and here we have an example of. Uh, of myocardial necrosis and inflammation, and here are the bacterial agents, here are the coronabacterial agents. <coughs> uh, miscellaneous diseases in the cardiovascular system, and certainly one of, the, uh, one of them would be myocardial degeneration or so-called cardiomyopathy. <coughs> and this is an age-related uh, degenerative disease um, that occurs uh, usually after one year, although you may begin, as in the, uh, as in chronic nephropathy, you may begin to see manifestations of this. I've seen evidence of myocardial degeneration in 90-day uh, studies, okay, in, in three-month studies. So, uh, so it, uh, the onset can occur pretty early. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, males seem to be more frequently uh, affected than females, and then by the time the animals, at least my experience in fisher rats, is that by the time the animals are 18 months of age, a significant number, I mean in the range of two-thirds to three-quarters of the animals, uh, will have uh, lesions. <coughs> and uh, what you see is, is uh, myocardial degeneration and necrosis. Um, in my experience, you see that less than you see the resolution from that <coughs> or the response to that. And the response to that would be uh, fibrous connective tissue scarring or interstitial fibrosis, um, some uh, lymphohistiocytic inflammation, and then a niche, a niche cow cells. Okay. And uh, it, the lesion seems to be more uh, predominant in the left ventricles and in the papillary muscle. Those are perhaps the active areas, and so that would be where you would tend to see it more. <coughs> Here's an example of uh, early change, all right? And these would appear as just sort of sporadic areas of, of uh, degeneration and uh, interstitial inflammation. And uh, this is what you will see in the, in the chronic lesions, okay, as, as uh, this damage is uh, resolved by a fibrosis rather than reproliferation of the uh, myocardial cells. And so you may see very extensive areas of this. Um, sometimes an adjunctive lesion with this is atrial thrombosis, and uh, if atrial thrombosis gets large enough, it can, ca it can cause sudden death. So again, I have in my memory that a uh, number of times um, an animal would have died suddenly on study, and the only significant findings would be at necropsy would be atrial thrombosis and myocardial degeneration. So the assumption was a signing cause of death. It was related to that. <coughs> um, a second uh, miscellaneous disease that may occur uh, um, is this so-called endocardial disease. This is an age-related, uh, low-incidence disease of uncertain etiology. Uh, perhaps uh, one to seven percent of the animals uh, um, on study uh, uh, may exhibit this. That seems a little high. What you will see is uh, uh, grossly as a whitish thickening of the uh, endocardium in the left ventricle, sort of um, a, a sort of uh, endocardial fibroelastosis, uh, which has been the term in companion animals. And here you can see this diffuse proliferation of this. Um, <coughs> the the concern would be. Uh, confusing this with uh, um, neurofibroma <coughs> or rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, probably more uh, this neurofibroma has been described in, in uh, the rat heart, and that needs to be differentiated. <coughs> it is a diffuse proliferation of, uh, of uh, fibroblast-like cells, uh, well set off from the myocardium, and again, this may also stimulate thrombosis as well. And there's a nice example of that. So almost eroding into, but, but pretty much confined to the uh, endocardium. Again, you can see in an isolated way, and looking at this, that this, this could be a very well differentiated um, neurolamoma or neurofibroma or nerve sheath origin tumor. So.
Um, again, another miscellaneous disease of the cardiovascular system would be granulomatous peritonitis, or per, or I'm sorry, granulomatous pericarditis, secondary to gavage accident, all right? And uh, this usually is a sporadic occurrence, although it can appear, as I can assure you, it can appear as an epizootic. And uh, I've made this disease, and probably uh, everybody else who has uh, um, any experience gavaging rats, I don't care how careful you are. Um, I had an interesting experience with it here just a year or two ago on, on uh, some uh, mammary tumor studies that I was and, uh, looking at the effects of nutrition. And, uh, and early on in the study, we created a, a, a multiple cases of this. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, it's all related to our gavage technique, okay? So it looked like we were having a, um, an epizootic of something because these animals were dying, but uh, on thorough post-mortem examination, uh, the, the findings are always quite similar, and that is you get tremendous um, granulomatous to fibrinous uh, inflammation around the heart and in the, in the pleural cavity, and... Uh, um, in some cases, uh, I, we, we, have an, we inoculated streptococci into the uh, uh, pleural cavity, probably either from the tip of the, uh, um, of, of the gavage needle, or we introduced it from the oropharynx, pushed it down into the esophagus and through the wall. Okay? But I mean, tremendous, tremendous growth of uh, gram-positive strep and, and all the inflammation associated with that. So it, it, it can happen. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, up close and personal here, if the animals survive for a while, you may get to see granulation tissue and, and all of those things. Uh, typically, the animals sort of don't do well for a while. And so, you know, or else sort of their weight gain goes to hell and they just kind of look sickly and ill and hunched up. And uh, um, I think in the, in the last study we had, uh, we, nobody died. I think we pretty much put everybody down, but they were close to dying anyway. Um, but in such a case, uh, if they go on for a couple of weeks or so, then you'll see uh, granulation tissue and chronic inflammation and, and all of those things. <coughs> uh, hemopericardium <coughs> is uh, um, a sometimes sporadic uh, incidence in the cardiovascular system and almost always related to, as you would guess, a heart stick for some reason or another. So if you're going to heart stick... Uh, if, you, if your pr experimental protocol is doing uh, um, intracardiac uh, bleedings or something and the animals are to survive, this isn't done terminally, um, sometimes improperly done, uh, those animals suffer hemopericardium and will die in tamponade. So it's very important for us as pathologists, you know, not to practice pathology in isolation. Uh, that's why it's important for you to review protocols, to be in part of that protocol planning session, to know how the animals were being experimentally manipulated because that's going to help you interpret your findings. And I think it's a mistake for us to simply say we're histopathologists and our in involvement in the studies is simply looking at the slides somebody brings to us. I don't think you're going to do yourself justice or the people you're supporting justice. You need to be actively involved from the start so that you know that <clears throat> if this, you know, if, if these, and if you had suddenly had 2% of the animals on study that had this lesion and there's no history of intracardiac puncture, then you've got a problem on your hands, right? It would be the same thing with the, uh, where you start seeing streptococcal pleuritis in animals and there's no history of gavaging these animals, you've got a problem on your hands, right? If, however, the animals are being gavaged, well, then now you're not so concerned about seeing streptococcal pleuritis. So it's very important for us to know the context of how the animals are being manipulated. <coughs> Again, another uh, incidental disease uh, of the cardiovascular system is so-called uh, polyarteritis nodosa or periarteritis nodosa. And uh, this is a very interesting inflammatory disease of the uh, muscular arteries, um, especially those in the mesentery. <coughs> um, the human disease is regarded as, uh, regarded as a hypersensitivity or immune complex uh, disease, and it's quite reasonable in looking at the pattern of the histopathology. Um, it's quite reasonable to to postulate that it may have a similar pathogenesis in rats, but that's uncertain, and the etiology of this is, is not known, all right? Grossly, 
uh, what you see, though, is quite characteristic, and that is these enlarged, torturous, uh, thick-walled, nodular vessels. Now, the lesion may be very segmental. And in fact, in, in my first experience with this, um, uh, and I don't know whether it was just in, in fisher rats, it's, it's described in a number of strains of rats, whether it was the fisher rats or the fisher rats that we were getting from Charles Rivers at the time, but quite commonly, we would see these little five or six millimeter sort of uh, grayish red sausages in the pancreatic artery. And it was just this little segmental part of the pancreatic artery that was involved, okay? Um, it, may be, it may be more extensive than that. So any, anything that looks like a nodular, thickened um, artery uh, needs, in, in, a rat, in, a, in, the, in the mesentery of rat, this needs to be considered. Uh, microscopically, uh, what we see is fibrinoid necrosis and uh, neutrophilic and lymphocytic and plasmacytic histiocytic inflammation with a fibrosis and thrombosis, all right? And it's, uh, when you think about it, I mean, those are the lesions that you would expect to see with chronic vasculitis anyway. So the, the concept of this being uh, hypersensitivity mediated is, is, is very real, I think. <clears throat> this is about the most extreme example of this I've ever seen. And you can see all these little nodules here in the mesenteric arteries, okay? Um, this is not this is not my usual this is not my usual experience. Usually, it's it's a very it's it's much fewer, much smaller. Nonetheless, though, it's an it's a finding that you have to deal with as it turns up. I mean, again, suppose 20% of the animals in the high dose group had this, and 1% of the animals in the control group had this. You'd have to be concerned that the that the compound under study may be doing something to upregulate or enhance expression of this disease and. And that's our, in the safety assessment business, that's what we're here to do. We're here to recognize those uh, lesions and postulate how could our compound be, be increasing or enhancing the incidence of that. And that could be a very important question. A compound could be doing something to cause hypersensitivity vasculitis, and that's the result of what we see. Um, here again, a, a very typical from uh, um, my first experience with this. Is, is here's the pancreas, and look at the size of the pancreatic arteries here. I, I, I don't have a gross to show you, but, but look, this is just tremendous increase. I mean, out of all proportion, what it should be. <clears throat> and this is what we see histologically, and again, it's a mishmash of lymphohistiocytic and neutrophilic inflammation with uh, fibrous thickening of the uh, um, uh, tunica media. Uh, the hem hemic lymphatic system, okay, will be next. Sort of my artist's way of <coughs> indicating hemic lymphatic. How, how else are you going to do it? I don't know. Um, viral diseases. Uh, remember that SDAV, uh, uh, the uh, um, coronaviruses, uh, um, specifically have been shown to cause lymphoid hyperplasia. But but really, I mean, if 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 we're going to talk about lymphoid hyperplasia as being a lesion, then lymphoid hyperplasia can be a response to a lot of different infectious agents, okay? <coughs> Bacteria, but, uh, but other, other than that, though, uh, uh, there are no viral diseases specifically expressed in the hemic lymphatic system, and, this, and the same would be true of the bacterial diseases. Once you get by the carinobacterial uh, um, abscess, and uh, again, you have to include salmonellosis in here, although, um, uh, we'll talk more in depth about salmonella with mice than we will in rats because uh, it occurs more commonly, but there is a, a frequent expression of it in spleens, uh, and so we'll deal with that later. Uh, mycotic and, and parasitic infections, uh, uh, none that are, are of, of specific importance, although if you get down into the textbooks, you'll, you'll find that there are some hematropic parasites that do occur. Um, we get down to neoplastic disorders, and uh, then uh, uh, we, do have to, we do have some common diseases that we have to deal with. And uh, one of them is uh, lymphoreticular neoplasia, the lymphomas and the leukemias. Uh, clearly not as diverse and as common in mice, um, as, uh, or in rats, as they are in mice. Uh, but there's no question that uh, lymphoma and leukemias do occur. Um, um, Thymoma occurs at a, at a low incidence, and this, is, this might be an example of, uh, um, I think this is a thymic lymphoma. I don't think it's, it's thymoma, but, it, but thymoma could look like that. 
but this really is the disease that uh, that occurs with any frequency at all um, and that would be the so-called large granular lymphocyte leukemia um, and again the incidence of this is quite strain dependent um, it's virtually non-existent in sprague dolly rats <coughs> it occurs with some moderate uh, to low to moderate level in Wistar first rats, um, but it's a disease that it, it's a tumor that appears to be um, increasing out of control in Fisher rats. Um, when I started studying this disease in the early 80s, um, the incidence uh, 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 levels that I think I was looking at were probably in the 20 to 25 percent range and some discrepancy between males and females. Now the people that have been tracking this disease very carefully at, at uh, the NTP um, uh, tell me now that the incidences are in the, in the 40 percent range and that in, in some smaller groups of, uh, in small groups of rodents it may be well over 50 percent. So there may be something happening in the Fisher rat genome um, that is permitting more frequent expression of this disease. Um, anyway, if you work with Fisher rats, uh, you're going to have to uh, deal with Fisher rat leukemia. Uh, fortunately, it's really sort of a no-brainer to diagnose, I think. I mean, the, the, the triad of signs is that the rats are pale because they're markedly anemic. Uh, they're icteric <coughs> because they have liver disease and they have tremendous splenomegaly. So pale icteric rats with palpable enlarged spleens all have LGL leukemia. <coughs> um, the, the, the normal rat, the normal Fisher rat spleen should weigh about a gram and uh, um, these, gr these spleens will go up to 25 grams in size. <coughs> Okay, integumentary system. Um, there are no viral diseases of the integumentary system. Um, there, are, there are a variety of nonspecific bacterial diseases that may cause dermatitis, um, and, and principally uh, strep and staph. And these would be uh, uh, of a sporadic occurrence and generally secondary to wounds. Do I have a, uh, yeah. And here's an example of, I think this is a staph dermatitis uh, secondary to um, trauma. Uh, mycotic and parasitic infections, uh, uh, there are, there is, again, a small range of these uh, that have been described, uh, some of which you'll have to deal with. Um, remember, as in many animals, dermatophytosis does occur in rodents. Um, almost always it's trichophyton, menograffides, rather than microsporum, but, but nonetheless, uh, um, dermatophytosis is uh, not quite as common as it is in mice, but it, but it does occur, and the lesions are quite typical. There should be no problem in making a diagnosis microscopically because you see suppurative folliculitis and furunculosis, and you see the mycelia and the spores uh, adhering to the hair follicles. Okay. <coughs> there are several uh, there are several uh, um, acariases, uh, um, one of which is Radfordia and Cifera, and the other which is uh, ornith Ornithonissus baccati, and I believe this is the Ornithonissus mite here. But um, again, what you would see grossly would be um, sort of maybe erythematous, uh, scruffy skin, and evidence of dermatitis. Okay, and I don't have—I wish I had gross to show you, but I, I don't. <laughs> uh, neoplasms, <clears throat> and the uh, rats have a lot of cutaneous neoplasms. Um, a, a quite common one, uh, which I referred to earlier in the talk, is uh, Zimbel's gland, uh, the Zimbel's gland tumors, and Zimbel gland, Zimbel's gland uh, tumors are Zimbel glands. Zimbel's glands are modified sebaceous glands that occur in the uh, external ear canal, and the Zimbel gland, the Zimbel's gland tumors are almost always diagnosed by their location. Okay, so large swellings beneath immediately below the ear, cutaneous swellings um, are probably 
um, expanding uh, Zimbel's gland uh, adenomas and carcinomas, and uh, depending upon how so uh, large they are, they may be quite ulcerated and, and hemorrhagic. I mean, that happens with large cutaneous masses uh, in rats uh, anyway. Um, This is the, uh, um, again, in, in trying to show this apposition, uh, uh, you can see that I mean, here is the external ear canal, here is the ear cartilage, here's the external ear canal, and here is this large tumor arising from these modified sebaceous glands at the base of the ear. Okay. <clears throat> They're, uh, I, I, don't, I, I can't give you any uh, incidence figures. They're relatively uncommon, but again, you know, commonness is a function of how many, how many uh, you've seen. And I mean, I've looked at tens of thousands and thousands of rats. And so to me, Symbol's gland tumor is a kind of a common tumor, even though I wouldn't be surprised to have somebody tell me that, you know, 0.2% of the, of the rats, uh, of, co of uh, control rats, have this. I mean, to me, I, I see it. It seems distinctive, so it seems common. Um, these are, th there have been studies in which carcinogens have readily induced this tumor, so uh, it, it does, uh, you know, it, it does impact. It is important to know those. Um, again, a, a variety of these skin tumors um, are often, uh, many of these uh, are, are glandular epithelial cells that are modified sebaceous glands, and the diagnosis is often based upon location, okay? I mean, this is, uh, this is a, uh, uh, either a propitial gland tumor or a clitoral gland tumor, depending upon whether it's a male or a female, but the tumor occurs in the same location. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this is an exorbital gland tumor, so it's one of those lacrimal gland, uh, uh, lacrimal glands in, occurring inside the orbit. We're looking sort of down on the animal. It's kind of hard to get an appreciation for that. Um, <clears throat> epithelial tumors are, so papillomas and squamous cell carcinomas and basal cell tumors are, uh, are relatively common. Uh, sarcomas are probably more frequent than epithelial tumors. Um, the classification of uh, cutaneous sarcomas in rodents is a crapshoot. Uh, um, lots of controversy, lots of changes, and I'm not going to go into it here. Um, and also, uh, I'll, I'll just briefly mention, uh, um, because you see it in the skin, probably the most common skin tumor we see in rats um, is a reproductive uh, tumor, and that is the mammary fiber adenoma. All right. I'll mention it in skin because you have to deal with it as a lump in the skin, but I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you a picture of it when we talk about, in a minute, when we talk about the reproductive system. Okay, um, miscellaneous. Uh, diseases in the skin, and probably the one that comes to mind uh, most readily is ringtail. Um, it's probably not a very common disease anymore. <clears throat> um, it clearly is a disease that has an environmental pathogenesis or is related to the environment. <coughs> and and uh, the environmental variable that it's related to is low humidity. Um, animals that are living in a less than 50 percent humid environment uh, um, will express this disease. It's usually a, a disease of young rats, and uh, uh, it's so-called ringtail because of uh, we see these annular constrictions of the tail grossly. Um, microscopically, it's not very impressive to see it, and I'll show you uh, an acute, uh, an acute uh, a manifestation, but edema, um, uh, spongiosis, necrosis, uh, separation of, uh, of the epithelial cells that may result in spontaneous amputations. And the, the pathogenesis, of course, uh, invokes hyperkeratosis and perikeratotic responses. And uh, this is what it looks like. Um, here's, a, here's a nice example of how humidity affects this. If you look at this is a, uh, these figures compiled by a study, but humidity over 60%, no incidence of all, and then as it drops down to 20, you can see more and more and more and more of the animals are affected, so it absolutely is relative humidity-based. And uh, here's the gross, uh, uh, here's these annual uh, uh, constrictions you see, and maybe a little amputation here, hence the uh, name ringtail. And then we get down to the microscopy is not very impressive. We see the spongiosis and loss of uh, separation of these cells in the prickle cell layer. Uh, 
And here, just up close and personal, we see this almost, almost like a cantholysis. OK. Good. Second carousel. Take a break. Reproductive system is next, and uh, there aren't a lot of viral diseases that express themselves in the rat reproductive system. I would mention that Killam rat virus does cause testicular necrosis, so that's been reported with Killam rat virus infection. I don't have lesions to show to you, but uh, um, generally uh, uh, not much in the way of, uh, of viral reproductive disease. <clears throat> the story is a little bit different uh, in, uh, with bacterial diseases, and that is that there is a genital form of mycoplasmosis uh, that occurs in rats. <clears throat> and uh, um, as in the other forms of um, mycoplasma infection, um, it tends to be uh, expressed as a subclinical endometritis that may go all the way in severity to frank pyometra. Um, other than that, there aren't clinical signs associated with this, so this may be an incidental finding for you at necropsy. Um, what you may see grossly is normal to cystic endometrial hyperplasia. My experiences and the, and the literature reports that there may be gross lesions in about thir only about 30% of, of the cases. And probably the most frequent lesion is uh, um, salpingitis and oophoritis. <coughs> <coughs> Histologically, what we would see is uh, suppurative to neutrophilic inflammation in the lumen of the uterus and the uterine glands. And there may be epithelial hyperplasia and squamous metaplasia, quite similar in the response to mycoplasma in other uh, organs, uh, organ systems. Um, uh, and a note uh, of interest is that there may be vertical as well as horizontal transmission in this disease. Not of concern to you if you're buying your rats, but some of you may wind up working in production facilities someday. Um, and that may be a problem. You diagnose mycoplasma pulmonis or uh, um, genital mycoplasmosis in your colony, and you're going to have a problem because there may be, there will be vert could be vertical transmission of this disease. And uh, here is an example of, uh, of uh, the suppurative uh, sal uh, salpingitis that occurs. I mean, here we, we have the tip of the uterus here. And here is the oviduct, uh, oviduct, and you can see that it is markedly dilated uh, with uh, um, and white and opaque, and uh, there is purulent inflammation in there. Um, sometimes uh, you get to see frank uh, pyometra, as in this case. So here is the unopened enlarged. Sometimes I know it's hard to get oriented, but here is the unopened enlarged uh, uterus and cut open, and there is. Uh, um, uh, pyometra in rats probably almost always uh, uh, related to uh, uh, this infection. <clears throat> and let's see here. Um, approximately 20% of the infected females are infertile, right? So that's, it's an important bug. 60% um, of the infected females have decreased fecundity. So even in subclinical infections, even in subclinical infections um, in your production facilities, uh, you start seeing a fall off in uh, um, fecundity, uh, uh, there could be a problem. All right. And I think this is, uh, yeah, let me, I'm going to back up. Okay, um, mycotic and parasitic diseases of the reproductive system, none worth mentioning. Um, neoplasms of the uh, um, 
reproductive uh, system, and there are a couple that we uh, um, need to be concerned with. One of them is the so-called endometrial stromal polyp, sort of a neoplasm, okay? And uh, I don't know if I'm gonna have a picture here uh, for you or not. Um, well, let's see. Um, what these look like is are segmental but relatively normal appearing swellings of one or both uterine horns. And histologically, uh, uh, there is variable uh, cellular stroma and glandular proliferation. Okay, that's not what, that's not what this is. I, I believe this is a cross-section of suppurative endometritis in the, in the rat. Um, and maybe I've got a slide out of order here. Uh, the second neoplasm that I want to uh, uh, mention that is extraordinarily common in rats, and that is mammary fibroadenomas. Very, very common, uh, primarily in females, um, uh, with a dramatic increase in incidence after the 18-month landmark, okay? And they may occur anywhere from the axillary region, um, as this one is, um, to the inguinal region, as this one is, okay? And they appear as smooth, firm, lobulated, uh, subcutaneous masses that can get very large and ulcerate. And uh, although these don't represent <coughs> by themselves a threat to this animal's life, um, they are a threat in a sense that, that if they break open and ulcerate and get infected, um, they, may, they may require that you put that animal down or delete that animal from the study. I mean, the, the Isla Cook people uh, will be on you all over the place. And uh, again, just recently, <coughs> in the last couple of years, I've had, I've had uh, 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 some grants looking at mammary uh, uh, cancer because it's a, a hot, uh, uh, it's politically hot and biologically an important problem in our culture today. And um, in working with uh, um, rodent models of, of carcinogen-induced uh, mammary cancer in which we make carcinomas, not fibroadenomas, but the problem is the same, and that is a mammary mass. Um, when these things get to a certain size and they break open and ulcerate, the laboratory animal veterinarian is on me like a, a buzzard on a gut wagon to put those animals down, and that represents lost data point for me. Also, the other problem, when you start thinking about it, and especially in dosed feed studies, as these things get big, all right, you have to ask yourself, um, with time, you know, who, what am I feeding, okay? Am I feeding the rat or am I feeding the tumor? All right. I mean, these. I mean, these. I mean, these things will get much bigger than this. So the question becomes: Well, you know, the 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 compound is dosed at a certain body weight, whatever. But at a point in time, the tumor represents a significant amount of that animal's body weight. And so, am I still delivering the same dose of compound to the rat? Because I'm delivering that compound to the tumor as well, right? <coughs> so they re represent some management problems for you. Not that they directly impact the health of the animal, but they're very common and you're going to have to deal with them and uh, what you'll have to do is uh, either take animals out of the study, uh, um, which we don't like to do. Um, histologically, uh, they vary quite a bit from being, you know, very fibrous to very adenomatous and anything in between. And I don't know that anybody makes any distinction, but I mean, this is the typical um, both fibrous connective tissue and, and well-differentiated acini, uh, some of which have a secretory product in them, okay? So quite a, a range of histological characterization. <coughs> um, ovarian teratomas are, uh, um, occur sp uh, sporadically. Uh, um, um, probably the most common tumor in the ovary and in aging uh, um, rats, but they're pretty rare in, in amongst themselves, okay? Um, I'll briefly mention uh, uterine adenocarcinomas. They're not common, but in hand Wistar rats, um, they're a major cause of femor uh, uh, female mortality, okay? And they cause, um, uh, as you would expect they do in, uh, in uh, humans and in rabbits, uh, widespread uh, trans-salomic uh, uh, carcinomatosis and, and uh, pulmonary metastasis. So not common in the strains of rats that I have lots of experience with, but well reported in hand Wistar rats as being 
a, a major cause of mortality. Again, another example of how s different strains of rats may express different diseases at different incidences, okay? Uh, what we're looking at here is um, Leydig cell tumors or interstitial cell tumors of the testis. Um, these are extraordinarily common in fisher rats, probably um, um, greater than 95% of the animals at two years of age will have this tumor, all right? And, and so the significance of this becomes uh, um, um, how well are we evaluating compounds for testicular neoplasia in this rat model? Well, it turns out for some metabolic reasons that, that it's probably okay that many compounds aren't impacting on the testis, but but very often the way we determine carcinogenesis in a study <clears throat> is by looking at an increased incidence of normally occurring tumors. Well, when you've got a tumor that occurs at a background level of 95%, that doesn't give you any leeway to decide that the compound caused testicular neoplasia or not. And uh, that's why the people who have been tracking the incidence of fissure rat leukemia are getting alarmed by the fissure rat leukemia because it's getting up there to where it is, I mean, I very frequently get asked to, to review studies uh, in which there is a high level or a high incidence of uh, fissure rat leukemia. And the, in, and the question always is, did the, compounds call, did the compound cause leukemia? Um, or is, is this just the normal incidence uh, uh, that's upregulated? And it's a, it's a very sticky issue. <coughs> anyway, these are very common in fissure rats, less common in other strains. Um, quite frequently what you see is multifocal yellow-white nodules in the, in the liver, or uh, in, in, the, in the testis, well illustrated here, that these testes often are enlarged. And because the tumor may cause vascular obstruction, there may be infarction and hemorrhage in this tumor as well. <coughs> and histologically, I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is pretty typical, uh, what you see. So here's lots of these nodules often coalescing, crowding out the other uh, uh, tissue, okay? So um, histologically, the cells look very much like Leydig cells do in the normal testis, so there, there's no problem making that diagnosis. And uh, just another uh, common, these are, these are placental attachment sites. Um, these are multiple symmetric uterine enlargements. This is, uh, this is a normal finding in rats postpartum, and uh, just not so that you're aware of that and don't get excited and, uh, and uh, worry about uh, some bizarre disease syndrome. Uh. Okay, musculoskeletal system. We're getting down to the end here, troops. <coughs> um, there are no viral diseases that I'm aware of that impact primarily in the musculoskeletal system. But there is a species of mycoplasma called Mycoplasma arthriditis under the designation of bacterial diseases <coughs> that is usually uh, expressed as an endemic infection in a few rats, okay? So again, it's a common theme with mycoplasma, uh, mycoplasma species, uh, uh, endemic, uh, primarily latent disease that may be reactivated by uh, stress and probably more frequent in young animals because they handle stress less well than uh, animals with a more mature uh, um, um, immune system. Uh, what, uh, it's primarily the tibiotarsal joints and radiocarpal joints that may be involved and what we'll see would be some erythema and swelling over those joints. Um, some decreased in range in motion, if you can, if you can measure range in motion in a rat. Um, and uh, there may be, it may progress to ankylosis with deformity, okay? And uh, again, a common response to arthritis of many different causes is exuberant periosteal new bone or PNB proliferation, okay? <coughs> the lesions are initially suppurative inflammation in the tendon sheaths that may progress to suppurative arthritis. and destruction of the articular cartilage. <coughs> I don't know if I have any to show you. I guess I, 
Um, this is an example, but it doesn't really show the lesions very well here. I mean, here are the joints. It doesn't really show that lesion very well. And I don't know if I have. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have. I don't have that. And this is something else. Um, again. Uh, bacterial diseases in the musculoskeletal system, we need to consider always uh, metastatic um, abscesses from uh, Corynebacterium cuchari. And uh, one that we haven't talked about uh, would be Streptobacillus, and I don't have any slides to show you that, but Streptobacillus um, may cause arthritis, separative arthritis as well. Usually uh, that's in the vertebral joints or the, or the tail. Mycotic and parasitic infections of the musculoskeletal system uh, are rare or of no importance. Uh, neoplasms are pretty rare. Um, with, uh, uh, you, you will see uh, osteoma and osteosarcoma in some animals. Um, they do occur. I don't know that there is any, are any uh, uh, strains that have a high incidence of that, but uh, you, will, you will see those. <coughs> Probably uh, the most common musculoskeletal disorder that I see in rats is a miscellaneous disorder, <coughs> and that is fibrous osteodystrophy related to chronic renal failure. So because you see a lot of chronic renal disease in rats, and it goes on a long time, as you're looking at bones in these rats, expect to see the lesions of renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. And here, is, uh, here we see this uh, fibrous osteodystrophy here. Endocrine system, okay. And in the endocrine system of rats, essentially only neoplasms are common lesions. All right, so I'm unaware that any of the infectious diseases uh, impact there. <coughs> <coughs> so expect to see pituitary tumors. These are extremely common. Uh, again, somewhat uh, um, strain uh, dependent a little bit, but uh, they tend to increase with age. Uh, the females tend to have more uh, diseases or, or more lesions with males. There may be some relationship to mammary tumors. Um, and clearly, the most common uh, disease are, are the benign tumors of chromophobes or chromophobe adenomas. <coughs> and uh, again, I hate to make puns, but this is a no-brainer in terms of, uh, of diagnosis, and that is uh, large, large masses uh, protruding from the cella tersica. Um, some of them will be carcinomas, but uh, uh, most of them will be adenomas. And these can get large enough that I think they may cause some CNS signs. All right, so not all CNS signs in rats will be uh, mycoplasma uh, related. So, so in the older animals, uh, you need to consider chromophobe adenomas as, as one of those. And this is uh, histologically, there's nothing unique about these. I think uh, this is a chromophobe adenoma in any species you would look at. So diffuse proliferation of, uh, of chromophobic, uh, homogeneous chromophobic uh, cells in a sort of a typical endocrine packeting. That is, uh, um, um, islands or cords of uh, more or less epithelioid cells with a thin fibrovascular packeting or stroma around them, what I like to call endocrine packeting, would be characteristic of this. Okay. Um, <coughs> thyroid tumors are also uh, common with the uh, um, ultimobranchial or C-cell uh, uh, tumors are probably more common than the follicular tumors, but both occur. I'm not sure grossly that you can appreciate the uh, um, the difference, you have to look at them histologically, but here's a, a little piece of trachea, and there's thyroid on this side, and then here's a thyroid with a big uh, um, thyroid tumor in it. <coughs> and here, this one happens to be, uh, this one happens to be uh, follicular, okay, a follicular tumor. Um, <coughs> adrenal tumors are common. Um, both cortical tumors, uh, cortical tumors, primarily uh, adenomas, but pheochromocytomas also occur. Uh, this, I'm sorry, we're still on. Uh, here is, uh, um, this is un uh, unusual. This is a parathyroid tumor, right? Parathyroid tumor. So here is thyroid, parathyroid tumor. Not, not particularly common, but uh, in fact, not seen them very often. Here is the uh, adrenal uh, uh, cortical tumor. Um, 
rec well, you just you recognize this as an adrenal tumor uh, only and then microscopically. Um, this is uh, a, cor a cortical tumor that tend to be very well differentiated. And then this is the pheochromocytoma, a medullary tumor. Again, we see endocrine packeting. And then uh, <coughs> they, uh, uncommon, but uh, again, uncommon is a very relative term, uh, would be tumors of the pancreatic islets. These tend to be single, well-circumscribed uh, masses with a uh, typical history. Um, many of these, and again, a number of years ago, uh, Chuck Capen and I published a, a short uh, paper on some of these and uh, had at our disposal some monoclonal antibodies uh, against uh, insulin, <clears throat> and we were able to determine that a significant number of these islet cell tumors in the rat um, <clears throat> contain insulin, but there's no evidence that these animals ever have hypoglycemia. So I don't know whether they're secreting uh, inappropriate levels of insulin or not. Okay. Okay, and lastly, uh, as a, uh, I, I don't have an icon for it, but lastly, I'd like to consider just very briefly body cavities <coughs> as, a, as an organ system, and because there, there is a neoplasm that occurs um, in the peritoneal cavity in rats. Uh, no viral diseases express, uh, um, no bacterial diseases other than um, the streptococcal pneumonia or the streptococcal uh, um, infection that we see in gavage accidents that may cause pleuritis, okay? <coughs> no mycotic or parasitic diseases that impact there, but there is a neoplasm uh, um, and mesotheliomas impact in body cavities in rats, and uh, they're uncommon, uh, but they are characteristic in the peritoneal cavity. And uh, what you tend to see is um, quite typically uh, in, in the less florid expression would be kind of this white nodular granularity on the epididymis of testes in males, uh, clearly as an incidental finding. <clears throat> but in the florid expression of the disease, we may see this sort of irregular, lumpy, bumpy, granular uh, proliferations all over the serosal surface of... Uh, of the body cavity uh, in animals and adhering to the body wall. And I think this is, uh, here's a nice example of this one without all the effusion in there, these multiple little uh, um, granular growths. Okay, often, in, again, in florid cases, we may see copious uh, uh, turbid ascites fluid uh, related to the uh, transcelomic implantation of the nodules. <coughs>